Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Vilnius. Uh, uh, I'm Thomas Gabrielovich, uh, board member of the Central Bank of Lithuania, and my responsibilities include financial stability, microprudential policy, bank resolution, and also market operations. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. It's our third biennial microprudential conference. The conference has been evolving in topics and complexity, and uh, some of you already already asked that question, so I'm going to answer to, to everybody. Uh, why this topic? Why residential property taxation? And the answer has many dimensions. First, uh, in 2018, there was an important property change in the property tax law. And we, as a central bank, as probably in all other cases, all institutions in any country, they have to comment on various, uh, various changes. So we did that as well. Uh, there are also currently uh, on the table other proposals even to amend further the current, current taxation law. And uh, we realized that taxes uh, can have quite, quite a macroprudential dimension. They might have an impact. And we also realized in a central bank, we don't have expertise on these issues. These are completely different matters. So we all of a sudden, we started developing that expertise, understanding the interaction of, of taxation and macroprudential policy. So this is how it happened, basically, and uh, since we always try to have, a, to have an interesting topic for, for the conferences in Vilnius, uh, so we thought that this is a topic which hasn't been covered so far, and the issue is really important, and, and uh, that's, we, we have you all here, and most of you say that the topic is really interesting. And uh, I think this topic is going to evolve. And, and more will be done. There is a lot of work on the interaction between monetary policy and macro policy, but not for fiscal policy and taxation in particular. And um, I have to say, the choice was obvious, because uh, taxes and house prices, an irresistible combination. <laughs> so it was a very easy choice, in a way. So, uh, so much for introduction from my side. Uh, I would like to conclude now, not to, to take much of your time. And in conclusion, uh, I wish you fruitful discussions, lots of new interesting insights, and uh, also as well as having some, some good, very good time in Vilnius. Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our first speaker, Hendrik Brekornier from the Swedish Supervisory Authority, and to deliver his keynote speech. Please, Hendrik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pat. I don't need a Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to you and the Bank of Lithuania for arranging this, and of course especially of, for inviting me here uh, to speak as a keynote speaker. Uh, as you all know, the topic of the conference is real estate taxes and macroprudential policy. I find this a very important subject, and let me start by explaining why. It may be obvious to you. Uh, first, real estate busts create deepen and prolong downturns. Sometimes they even bring financial crisis. In Sweden, we experienced that in the early 1990s. And something similar happened in Lithuania and many other EU countries during the great financial crisis. What happens in real estate markets matter a lot for our economies. And while this speech will focus almost single-handedly on residential real estate. Let me stress that I think that commercial real estate markets pose similarly sized challenges uh, for our economies, albeit they may be in a slightly different uh, form. But that is not something I will dwell on today. Second and related, the combination of real estate markets and mortgages creates possibilities for leverage for large sections of the population. I would say that the scale of this leverage would be almost unimaginable for most of us if we were talking about investing in any other kind of asset. But when it comes to real estate, we've somehow got used to it, or perhaps just resigned to the fact. Uh, indeed, 
Behavioral research seems to suggest that key economic decisions in life, such as house purchases, do not involve more deliberate and calculating analysis uh, on the household's parts than less important decisions. But it's not only how we take these decisions, but also when we enter that is critical for us. The combination of often dysfunctional functional re rental markets and the fact that housing demand, to a large extent, is driven by idiosyncratic factors, like when we start work, where we get a job, and when we find a partner, simply means that life events determines when we enter the housing market. And when we enter matter a lot. Let me use myself as an example. My life situation was such that I needed to enter the real estate market in Sweden in 1993. For those of you that are of my age and perhaps coming from, from, from this region, you know that this was at the trough of the Swedish housing market in the worst recession we've seen since the Second World War. It was a good time to enter the market. But that was not the reason that I entered. It was simply because I needed somewhere to live. Uh, and since then, of course, it's been a good 25 years. Prices have increased for, I would say, 23 of those 25 years. They are now 300%, 40% higher than when I bought my first apartment. So it turned out to be a good investment. Uh, have I entered the market, for whatever reason, perhaps being a slightly different cohort, two years earlier, however, at the peak, uh, things would have been very different. Then I would have to struggle for eight years just to recover my initial price of, of this first, first apartment. Now, a boom and bust scenario has to some extent been replayed during recent years since the grand, great financial crisis, but on a global and European scale. Uh, if you look at this figure, you see interest rates, but also house prices in the Eurozone. And they peaked in 2008, and actually only crawled back above this peak eight years later. Something similar to what happened in the Swedish market in the 1990s. And while prices have gained pace in recent years, this has been on the back of ever lower uh, interest rates. So while real property prices and its twin household debt are and should be key concerns for many policymakers, the question is how we can manage those risks in a sensible way. This brings us directly into the subject of this conference. Uh, and while admitting that I'm not a, a total expert on all the issues to be discussed here, and hence I really look forward to listening to, to the discussions over the next two days, let me share some initial thoughts on macroprudential policy and real estate taxes. Uh, and while I think that the two policy areas in definitely affect each other, I think there are good reasons to, th to think that tax policies often are less than perfect substitutes, to say the least, for macroprudential measures. And I will dwell a bit on that. So let me start with a simple one, I think. That is the political economy a case for macroprudential policy. And why fiscal policy and macroprudential policy probably are not close substitutes, at least timing-wise. The delegation of macroprudential tools to supervisors, central banks, or, or uh, stability councils rests on two pillars. First, these authorities have the expertise and the available tools uh, to deal with financial entities and therefore maintain financial stability. Secondly, the second pillar, the delegation of macroprudential policy to some sort of independent agency should lessen the time inconsistency bias. And given the length of the typical financial cycle and the lack of information-rich indicators on financial stability, I would say that time inconsistency problems in this area are arguably more severe than in monetary policy. It's simply easier to get away with really responsible policies in an area where performance is hard to measure in real time and costs will often surf surface far in the future. There is also some evidence suggesting that macroprudential policy tends to be countercyclical, uh, as, for example, shown by the 2018 ESRB review of macroprudential policies. 
Now, if we look at fiscal policies, however, especially in Europe, I would add, uh, things look a bit different. In general, fiscal policy has been prone to deficit, deficit spending, and especially over the last 10 years, become more procyclical. It would thus be a tall order to assume that property taxation could deal with financial cycle developments in a timely fashion. And indeed, the example below that I will show you uh, will give you the exact opposite evidence. So now let's turn to the trickier question whether property taxes and macroprudential policies are substitutes in an economic sense rather than a political economy sense. Now one way to start to think about this, I think at least, is whether there are any macroprudential tools that tax policies couldn't mimic, at least in theory. And I think that given the wealth of fiscal instruments that we do have, or potential fiscal instruments that we have, this is probably not the case. Uh, so in theory, at least, tax policy should be omnipotent. And hence, in theory, it could replace macroprudential policy. In practice, though, I think there are two things that we need to overcome in order to, to ensure that that's really the case. And I'm very doubtful that we will actually fully sort of uh, answer to these questions. The first, and, and I guess to some extent obvious thing, is that by giving an ex explicit macroprudential motive to fiscal policies, we would put an additional objective on an already overburdened policy area. Economic theory suggests that property taxes should be set fulfilling several objectives, including revenue raising, symmetry of taxation, efficient taxation, housing and labor mobility, and distributional concerns. And balancing these purposes is already a challenge, I would argue. And adding financial stability and credit growth would make it even more so. Second, I think that cash flows beat present values. Now, what do I mean with that? I think that it's typically the case that policy changes that are permanent nature, such as a property tax reform, will often deliver much smaller effects than what present value calculations would suggest, at least in the short term. Uh, it also means that actions that affect cash flows negatively today but perhaps even positively in the future, will deliver larger impacts than the present values suggest. One example I will show you later on is, is the kind of amortization requirements that we've put into to Swedish mortgages, which seems to have quite big effects uh, on, on, on the behavior of, of, of uh, uh, mortgages and, and uh, household borrowing. Now, this challenge will mean that present value-rich instruments like taxes will have to be used more aggressively to achieve the expected effects. Let me now turn to whether property taxes can mitigate risk buildup in the household sector and residential property market. To do this, I would first like to look at property taxes across Europe. Now, this slide shows income from recurrent taxation from immovable property as a share of GDP for the EU 28 countries. On average, uh, revenues equals roughly 1.6% of GDP, ranging from 3% for France to zero in, in Malta. While not trivial, recurrent property tax revenues amounts to less than 10% of the revenues countries typically receive from taxation of labor income. So it's not that huge. So how important are property taxes for property prices? And to what extent can they mitigate financial stability risks related to property prices and household indebtedness? Now, I'm not saying that I have the full answer, but one rough way to gauge this is to plot house price to income ratios deviations versus the real estate related taxes that we see here. And we get this picture. So we basically have estimated overall valuation of housing prices on the y-axis and tax revenues levels of them in relation to GDP on the x-axis. And the dots here are, are, are different EU countries. 
Now the black line in the middle, that's the regression line, which basically says the relationship is zero. Uh, so at least the impact of levels of housing taxation on house price misalignments are at the minimum dwarfed by other drivers. Uh, as I'm sure we will discuss more during the conference, this is not the end of the story, of course. Indeed, several studies, including one that we will discuss later on uh, tomorrow, will show that higher property taxes tend to lead to less pr house price volatility or deviations. In terms of the figure that we have here, it typically would mean that observations to the right, that is over here, should on average deviate less uh, from the zero than observation to the left. And at least if, if you use some kind of eyeball econometrics, there seems to be something to it. But as I said, we will get much better evidence on that later during, during the conference. I would now like to turn to a very concrete example of a property tax reform. Uh, you may not see it, but this is, this, is, this is a Swedish suburb, quite wealthy one. And the property tax reform I would like to discuss is, is the Swedish experience of lowering and capping the property tax between 2006 and 2008. I will do this in order to illustrate the challenges that property taxes have as a substitute for macroprudential measures. And I would also like to compare it a bit to, to uh, the kind of measures that we've been taking from a macroprud stance uh, the last 10 years. Now, an obvious thing to note is that the property tax reform, which meant lowering property taxes in general in Sweden, did not tick the box of good timing, to say the least. The promise to abolish the housing or cutting the housing property tax was made at a point in time when mortgages grew by 15% per annum, and housing prices had increased 50% over the preceding five years. Clearly, concerns about financial stability and house prices had not been given priority when announcing re the reform. In fact, the promise to cap the tax in order was done in order to curtail rising property tax payments for some chunks of the population. And it may actually have been a vote winner in, in, the, in the election of 2006. That's at least if you quote the at that time sitting prime minister. And it illustrates the risk of pro-cyclicality of fiscal policy. Now, prior to 2006, uh, the Swedish property tax was rather uncomplicated. It meant a 1% annual taxation on tax value, and tax values were roughly 0.75% of the market value, which meant it implied a 0.75% uh, tax on the market value. It was replaced by a municipal fee, uh, the, this fee was capped at 700 euros a year. Roughly half or a bit more than half of the population was not affected because the property taxes were lower than this cap before the reform. But those that were above this cap were, were of course, affected. Now, for while most households were not affected at all, if you, if you owned a high price property, effects were quite significant. So households owning, holding properties with higher market values typically uh, saw a cut in their tax bill of around 2,000 to 3,000 euros per annum. That is, the tax bill was cut by a to a fifth uh, due to this reform. And for the most attractive uh, properties, the cap meant that there were quite dramatic effects on, on net present values. In fact, for the top 1%, the net average net present value of property increased with roughly 170,000 euros as a consequence of this reform. So what happened to property prices? Well, this shows price developments around the time of the reform. The two lines here, the first one is when the reform was announced, and the second one is when it was fully implemented. Uh, the red line here, it shows prices in medium-sized cities. You might say that this corresponds to the average Swedish households. 
The yellow line, on the other hand, shows price developments in Lidingö, where the picture is from, which is a wealthy suburb close to downtown Stockholm, where you would find most, a larger chunk of the, the people that gained from, from this reform. Now, following the announcement date, the price developments in the, these two categories starts to drift apart. Over the 15 months between announcement and full implementation, house prices in leading increased by 7, 27%, and they increased by 10% in the medium-sized city. By end 2009, prices were up 40% in leading and 15% in medium-sized cities. Now, of course, this chart doesn't tell the full story of the impact of the reform. In fact, they tend to severely estimate, overestimate the effects. Uh, as it does not control for other price drivers, including demographics, including incomes and interest rates. One alternative approach, which I may add, was, was the approach that we used in the Ministry of Finance, where I worked at the time, was to look at, at uh, use, how user costs were affected. Now, given the cap of, 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 of the new tax, the effects of user costs were highly nonlinear. For those that were not affected, well, of course, user costs remained unchanged. For those that were affected, user costs fell by roughly 7% on average. And for the top 1%, user costs fell by 16%. And the difference between 16% and 7%, at least to some extent, mimics the differences between these two samples here. Now, the crux is, however, that actual price adjustments were not nearly in line with what user cost estimates suggested. A recent study done by Michael Linder and Louisa Persson, uh, published recently, using the uh, difference in difference approach to individual mortgages, find price effects that are dwarfed by user cost changes. So this picture basically shows the effects on market values for the 95% that were affected, uh, sorry, the 100% those that were affected, but those were least severely affected and those were basically your leading uh, households. Now the shaded area shows the changes in user costs in negative terms, and the yellow ones show what actually was the price impact of this. So for 90% of those affected, user costs fell on average by 7%. Actual prices stayed the same. We only see significant effects for the very high end of the market. And even there, the effects are much smaller than what user costs suggested. So all in all, the effects on prices were way lower than what we would have expected. Now, what is particularly important, I think, in looking at this uh, reform is that compared to many other studies, it actually looks at a national tax reform and it also establishes an untreated control group. I'm sure we'll come back to these sort of econometric issues later on. But this means that it avoids many of the endogeneity and causality problems uh, that cross-section analysis entails. Uh, the virtual non-existent effect of the tax reform, of course, raises concerns over the usefulness of tax policies in this perspective, and broader questions the user-cost approach. Uh, and I'm not going to go into explaining the potential causes here, but I think, at least, that the issues like cognitive limitations from those that are participating in the market, credit market frictions, and possibly also housing supply are factors that could bear on this issue. And learning more about these factors could help us designing better policies. Now, if, if the effectiveness of property taxes in curtailing housing booms and debt overhang can be questions, what do we think that macroprudential policies can do? It turns out, I would say, a bit, or even quite a lot. To see this, uh, I would like to show this figure, which shows impact of, of the free borrower-based measure that we at Finansinspektionen that we have imposed on, on the Swedish mortgage market. 
It's basically an LTV ceiling and two amortization requirements being done respectively in 2010, 16, and 2018. These have also been evaluated using difference in difference approaches, so it's sort of done on a household level basis. Now, this is effect on, 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 on new mortgages, that is something that should be clear, and on housing prices in general. And if you add the effect of, of all the three measures together, you would say that mortgage demand decreased, the size of mortgages increased by roughly 12% due to these measures. Uh, and this, as I said, initially only affected uh, new mortgages, but of course eventually this will eat into the stock and eventually affect all, all, everyone participating in the market. One thing to note is that the effects on, on mortgages are much higher than on high housing prices, which simply reflects the fact that when, when we put restrictions on, 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 on borrowing, people use more, more of their own capital to fund, keep, their, keep up their housing consumption. So my reasoning so far has led me to conclude that it's hard to set, see property tax as being a strong substitute for macroprudential measure when dealing with risks related to property and debt booms, both for political economy and for economic reasons. Now let me raise two objections to this conclusion. Uh, these objections are clearly more relevant in markets other than the Swedish mortgage market. Uh, in its current incarnation at least. They may also prove to be growing over time. And thus, I would say that the Swedish re residential real estate market to some extent may be in a macro potential sweet spot today that may not prevail over space or time. This macro potential sweet spot relies on the fact that Swedish housing today is financed to an overwhelming extent by Swedish banks in form of mortgages through the balance sheets of the banks. As a regulator, your ability to use macroprudential tools in this kind of context is quite unconstrained. Now, one way to illustrate this is, is to look at a two-dimensional diagram with the dimensions banks and non-bank source of lending and domestic and foreign lenders. And lending to Swedish residential real estate is squarely, oops, is squarely down here in southwest, uh, meaning that it's domestic banks, banks that provide most of, of, of the mortgages. Now, of course, in other countries, things look a bit different. In the northwest, we have mortgage-based system, but it's mainly provided by foreign banks. And here, macroprudential tools are more constrained. We need to rely on reciprocity. And when it comes, at least to some of the borrower-based measures that we have been applied, you have to prove that you have a consumer protection mandate as well. And in relation to the Swedish residential real, residential real estate financing, Lithuania could perhaps be an example here. In Southeast, mortgages are provided by market-based entities rather than banks. And as I guess you're all well aware of, the macroprudential toolbox here remains underdeveloped and largely untested. And the no non-bank finance residential real estate, for example, in the Netherlands, we see that this is a growing share of, of the economy. And indeed, indeed, there's something happening in Sweden as well, moving us in this direction. Of course, moving to the northeast, the empty space here, you would have lending provided by non foreign non-banks, non and this is where the number of instruments we have as policymakers, macroprudential policymakers, is very limited. Unfortunately, this is also a space where we see a lot of things happening. For example, in the Swedish case, a lot of the CRE investment that goes into the Stockholm uh, commercial property market is from foreign hedge funds and our ability to restrict that in any, any sort of useful way is very, very limited. So, you could say that macroprudential tools are becoming less potent, moving from 
southwest to northeast. And unfortunately, I would say that trends, at least for us, are really that our, our lending in general is moving in that direction, meaning that typically macroprudential pools in the current uh, incarnation, at least, will become less efficient dealing with uh, house price bubbles or dealing with high indebtedness. But that is, of course, not necessarily the case for property taxes. So you would, uh, could argue that, in relative terms, property taxes would show up as a more potent instrument moving in this direction. To conclude, I think that there are sound reasons to think that property taxes will affect the need and scope for macroprudential policy. I also, however, think that there are a number of reasons that tax policies cannot easily replace macroprudential policies. The reverse is, of course, also true. But these are my personal views, and I very much look forward to learning more over the next two years. So thank you very much. Thank you for Thomas and uh, Mr. Braconer for an excellent uh, keynote speech. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, my name is Christina and I will be your host for today and tomorrow. And without a lot of taking a lot of your time, I would like to present the first session on real estate related taxation, theory, practice and links with macroprudential policy. And I would like to welcome uh, Mr. John Fell, who is the Deputy Director General of DG Macroprudential Policy and Financial Stability at the ECB, who will be the moderator of that session to present the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Christ Thank you Christina. Um, so this is my third time at this uh, Bank of Lithuania Financial Stability Conference, and I have to say, well, Small confession, it's not only because I like Vilnius as much as I do, but it's because I keep on coming back here because the questions that are posed uh, at these conferences to conference participants, I think, are they're always thoughtful, they're always challenging, and they're often covering ground um, that is not covered elsewhere. Um, and on issues that I think, um, well, you can see it by the, by, by, by the number of people here, um, on issues that are, have broad interest to the macroprudential policy community. This year is no exception. Um, we all know that there are links between uh, macro, macro, macro pru and, and fiscal policy, but what are they exactly? I think in the real estate markets, uh, they are, it's probably the place where the, the, the overlaps and the linkages has the greatest amount of concentration, and I think that was also borne out by the, by, by the speech. Uh, that, that Henry um, gave us at the beginning. Now, the job of this panel um, is to bring us up to speed, um, both on the theory and on the practice, um, and on the links um, between um, real estate taxation and, and macroprudential policy. Um, the first speaker is Hans-Jörg uh, Blockleiger. Hans-Jörg is a senior economist and head of the Russia and Lithuanian desk at the OECD, and his presentation is entitled Taxing Real Estate, a Macroprudential Tool. After that, we're going to have Dennis Egan uh, from the IMF. Dennis is a deputy uh, division chief uh, for macro of, of the macrofinancial division um, in the research department um, of the IMF. And then we will have, finally, uh, Dubravko Mihelyev, uh, who is an advisor in the Monetary and Economic Department for the BIS. Um, so but we're going to begin uh, with Hans-Jörg. So Hans-Jörg, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Thomas, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, actually, John uh, stole my introduction. I wanted to say the same thing. Um, while many international organizations and also national agencies deal a lot with the impact of taxation on, on uh, volatility of the economy, volatility of house prices, I think it's the first time that the conference is explicitly dedicated to the link between, between uh, taxing, taxation structure, and its impact on the, on the volatility, on its impact on the volatility of 
of house prices, on the volatility of the economy, and the possible macro potential uh, implications. Okay, now what? Yeah. What are we t actually talking about? Um, Hendrik al already started with the, with the topic. House prices are rising. They have been risen quite a lot uh, over the past 10 or 20 years. They're rising more than real incomes per capita. And they're rising more in East or Central and Eastern European countries than across, uh, for instance, uh, OECD Europe. Uh, this picture even hides that there are strong differences. It's not only between countries, but even between, um, between uh, different geographical areas within, a, within the same countries. Uh, house prices certainly have risen much more in Vilnius, Riga or Tallinn than they have risen somewhere outside in the countryside. So this picture actually is already quite, uh, is, is telling much less than what is really happening in the big, in the big metropolitan areas in, in these countries. Now also uh, a point which we have been dealt a little bit less so far is what, does, what do these house prices actually mean for the households? Uh, household debt, which is usually, which, of which the, the largest part is mortgage debt, the largest part of household debt is actually mortgage debt, has also been risen uh, across, across the OECD. It has been risen less in the same countries I was just showing you but still uh, it is rising more or less inextricably. And now if you bring the two things together, you see the more house prices are rising or have been risen over the past 10 or 20 years, the more household debt has increased as well. So in a way, we have to address macro potential regulation from both sides, from the indebtedness of the households and from the house price increases. Okay, now what does that mean for taxation? You already saw that picture, it's just the same in blue. Before it was yellow, now it is blue. But it shows the same, uh, it shows the same um, structure of immovable property taxation across the OECD. There are more countries on that, on that picture than on Henrik's, on Henrik's one. Um, but what the picture says is essentially the same as Henrik was saying, immovable property taxation is relatively modest across the OECD. There are a few countries where it is important, it's mainly the Anglo-Saxon countries where property or immovable property taxation has a, has a, has a long history. Um, for simplicity's sake, we take France as an Anglo-Saxon country. But in most other countries, and especially in Eastern and uh, in Central and Eastern European countries, with one exception, I think it's Poland, property, immovable property taxation is relatively low or, or, or almost inexistent. So the property taxation as a kind of a, a mean for macroprudential uh, policy doesn't have the real uh, volume to act as such. Now what is actually more interesting is, is not that the property taxation is, is modest, that can be changed, but the property taxation essentially is a subnational tax. It's in most countries the subnational authorities, either the states, the regions, departments, or especially the municipalities, they have the right to set tax rates and in some cases even the tax base. Macroprudential policy is clearly a national policy. Property taxation is a local policy. Now figure out that the mayor of Vilnius gets contacted by the central bank head by saying, well, actually, when raising or lowering your property taxes, you should think of macroprudential policy. You already see that there's a lot of coordination issue here. At the Immovable property taxation is one of the taxes which, because it is not a national tax, because it's not a central government tax, is actually quite far away from the usual national macro potential policy measures we are, thinking of, we are thinking about when we are thinking about stabilization of the, of the economy or of house prices. 
we did a few years ago, we did um, kind of an analysis to see whether property taxation actually does influence the volatility of house prices. And we checked both whether it does affect the rise or the increase of house prices and whether it affects the volatility of the house prices. And indeed, what we found out is property taxation, and again, it's the immovable, the recurrent immovable property taxation, indeed does both reduce the volatility of house prices and it can also dampen the house price increases. The effect is, is significant across the OECD countries. Also, the, the actual economic effects so or the, the real impact is relatively modest. Uh, if you inc these, these measures say that if you inc double the size of property taxation, so for, going from the OECD average from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP, actually reduces fluctuations or house price increases by around 4 to 5 percent. Well, one reason why this is the case is that property taxation actually doesn't respond a lot to fluctuations of house prices or, or the economy. In most countries, the property, properties are not re-evaluated re uh, regularly. It's just an index. If everything goes well, it's just an index to, to, to capture the increases of house, pricing, uh, of, of, um, of house price values. So the property tax is actually quite a stable tax, not reacting much to economic fluctuations. That might explain why if you, do, if you run this type of regression, you don't get a big, big impact, which, is one of the first, or which leads to one of the first policy recommendations. Of course, if you have a property tax, link it much better to, um, to, the, um, uh, to, uh, to, to the evaluation of, of property, to the, to the value of property, of property, to the value of property, of houses. Now there are other taxes that are linked to, uh, to, uh, to real estate, to housing. It's not only the immovable property taxation, it's also there are different types of transaction taxes on property, there are capital gains taxes on property, and there are even some short-term taxes on property. I mean, most countries have this kind of what is usually called a speculation tax. If you sell your property within a very short period, let's say between two and five years, you pay additional capital gains taxes. So it's interesting to see what is the effect of these taxes on, uh, on, on house prices, house price increases and volatility. There are a few studies testing that. There's, I only found one, one Swiss study on, on, on the impact. The result is rather clear. If you take the transaction taxes, so just you, you sell your house, you pay 20, 25% of your, of, your, of your property value to the, to the taxman, that has no impact on, the, on, property, on property prices or increases of property prices. If you, if you have capital gains taxes, that already has quite a significant impact on house prices. So the higher capital gains taxes, the higher are the house price increases. And if you introduce this, short, this type of short-term capital taxes, these speculation taxes, which are actually, in, in, let's say, in, in, in the popular mind, are thought to dampen house price, house price increases against speculation, dampen house prices, they actually do have the opposite effect. They increase house prices even more. Now again, property taxes, transaction taxes, capital gains taxes are not the only, uh, the only way of taxing property. Property can also tax through the income tax system. And if you look at the cross OECD countries, you see that Taxing property through the income taxes is often an alternative to property taxation. Countries with a high share of immovable property taxation have a low share of taxation of property through the income tax system and vice versa. Take for instance the US, which have a high share of property taxation, but property is not taxed through income taxes. In some European countries it's the opposite, like Luxembourg, or Switzerland or, or Austria, which have very low property taxation, but property is taxed through, through features like imputed rent 
or a type of very low deductibility of mortgage, of mortgage interest. So you can have both. It's, you, you, you can't only look at the immovable property taxation, you also have to look at the income taxation, the income taxation system and, to, and to, to analyze how property is taxed through the personal income system. And indeed, uh, if you go more deeply into, the, into an analysis of how property is taxed or how, how property is taxed uh, uh, through, the, through the income tax system, you see that one of the most prominent features in, uh, that, that international organizations or economic organizations are dealing with now is the way mortgage uh, mortgage interest payments are deduct deductible from income taxation. That's quite important. And it is one driver that is con or it's considered being one driver of the, of the house price increases or even house price booms over the last uh, 15 to 20, to 20 years. It's different across the countries. The way mortgages can be deducted from, from, um, uh, from the income tax, but most countries have some type of mortgage deductibility um, that, that, you, you, that you can deduct mortgages from your, from your income tax declaration. Now again, this is also something that can be measured. And uh, my colleagues at the OECD a few years ago did quite an extensive analysis of what factors actually drive house price volatility. These are just a few of them. Uh, it's, for instance, it's the loan to value ratio. So what are the caps? How do caps on, uh, on, on, on loan to value ratios affect house price volatility? How does banking supervision affect, or the way banking supervision is done, how does that affect um, house price volatility? Then especially, and I will come back to that point, how does, how does supply housing supply, the way housing supply reacts to rising demand, how does, it, how does this affect the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the volatility of house prices? Uh, and finally, of course, and I'm coming back to the topic, how does this tax relief on mortgage debt financing, so the, the, the deductibility of mortgage interest payments in the income tax system, how does this affect um, the, the house price volatility? Again, the finding is the more you can deduct, the more you can deduct mortgages or mortgage interest payments from your income tax declaration, the more house prices tend to be volatile. So the more boom and bust cycles in the, uh, in the, um, in the housing market you, uh, you do observe. Then the the most brand of the brand newest uh, research that now brings together the different types of taxation and adds them up to a kind of universal marginal tax rate on, on housing, so including property taxes, transaction taxes, the income taxes, the imputed rent. I think the mortgage deductibility is not in here, but just think that now we are talking about the entire, uh, the entire marginal tax rates on housing. The finding is you don't have to look at all these figures. The finding here is the higher the taxation of, or the higher taxation of housing through the property tax system, through the income tax system, the lower are the cycles between boom and bust. So real, or real estate taxation and again, I'm not only talking about the property tax, but also about the income tax and all the taxes. But the higher these taxes, or these, put it more directly, these taxes can actually dampen house price cycles as well as economic cycles. Okay, what does that mean? What could be our conclusions? Or what could be our policy policy findings. But the first point is when we talk about housing, we first talk about the housing market. The evolution of the, the last 15, 20 years, the, 
the rapid increase in house prices was mainly driven by, and I think that was already shown, was mainly driven by the, by the declining uh, uh, interest rates and innovations in the financial sector, like a much easier, uh, much easier access to credit. So demand has actually been fueled, and that demand is mostly responsible for the increase in the house prices. Now, if you talk about housing markets, we have to take both sides, not only the demand, but also supply. The point is that housing supply never fully reacted to that rising demand. And it, in some cases, supply was even more restricted, um, or housing supply was even more restricted than it was 15, 20, or even 30 years ago. If you go through all the restrictions from urban planning to infrastructure to rent control, uh, housing supply is today not keeping up with, with housing demand. And that's the main reason why, uh, why we have such a why we have a house price increases that are much above the real income increases. So if you talk about macroprudential policy to somehow to address house price increases and house price volatility, actually the first thing or the first best would actually be go to back to the housing, to the housing market, to housing policy, and check what is actually hampering an increase in housing supply and go back to, to the structural issues to the structural issues uh, in the housing markets, which are basically how or what, what are the drivers that hamper increasing supply? What are the policy measures we have to take to increase housing supply to meet the rising, rising demand? But now coming back to the, to the uh, tax side uh, on the, of the, of the well, of this, of this issue of rising and volatile house prices. The main message would probably be, do no harm. Tax and fiscal policy have a specific objective. They are meant to raise money for the public services. And they have to do that in the most efficient way. They should avoid uh, un, um, unwarranted uh, uh, distributional effects. And of course, they should avoid um, Unwant, unwanted effects on the stability and volatility on the stability of the economy and of the house prices. So rather than now trying to integrate the tax system into the prudential policy toolbox and doing all these fancy things or try to coordinate, it's better just to see what are the main issues in tax policy that help avoid unwarranted effect, unwarranted stability effects on the economy. And that's actually what much of the OECD work of the, uh, of the past few years has clearly been stated and has become quite of a shared wisdom, I think not even uh, only across the OECD, but across uh, many international organizations. Strengthen recurrent immovable property taxation, so increase the property tax is probably the most prominent one. I think there is no single economic survey dealing with tax issues that hasn't at least one recommendation saying increase property taxation. There are other issues more related to the income taxation um, or to the income tax system of which there are mainly two. One is on the, on the deductibility of mortgage interest, which is reduce it, because that really infl inflates house prices. And the other one is trying to introduce, um, uh, in, to insert imputed rent, so a kind of, a, of, a, of, a, of an artificial rent for, for, uh, for owner-occupied owner housing. Then there is one issue, and uh, we might come back on that issue, is the capital gains tax. Uh, from an economic point of view, from an efficiency point of view, capital gains taxes are quite, are quite warranted. They're quite liked by economists. If you look at now the stability, stability issue, the effect on house prices, on the rising house prices, the issue might, look, might be uh, a bit different. There might be a tension between having a uh, an efficient capital gains taxation and its effect on the, on the, um, 
uh, on, the, on the economy and on house prices. As said before, institutional settings matter. Uh, tax policy is done by other institutions and macroprudential policy. So if really you want to, uh, if you want to insert or combine taxes or insert tax policy in, into the, the, the toolkit of macroprudential policy, it requires, a lot of, it requires a lot of coordination. There are central banks, there are the financial su supervision uh, authorities, there are the local authorities, especially with the, uh, with the property tax. There are the tax departments that all have to be coordinated when it comes to, to the question how to, how to use taxation as a macroprudential tool. And finally, it's all very political. Economists love the property tax. Everyone else hates it. The, the economists, they hate mortgage, deductibility, mortgage interest deductibility. Everyone else loves it. Taxation is a very political issue um, and property taxation even more. Uh, getting a property tax reform through either in the property tax system or the income tax system is one of the hardest things you can imagine. And there are actually few examples of successful property taxation, reforms of property taxation that increased the property taxes. It can work, but it worked so rarely. Um, so the timing, the scope and the sequencing of such political reforms is key when you want to bring a successful property tax reform through. And maybe in the next, over the next two years, over the next two years, the economists of the of Lithuania Central Bank can think about designing a politically palatable property tax reform and have a conference uh, in July 2021 about how they designed a successful property tax reform. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to for the questions afterwards. To join for the panel discussion, colleagues. Okay, um, just wait till Hans Mark has seated himself. So, okay, so the the aim of this session um, was really, I think, to bring us all up to speed on the on the theory, on the practice, explore a bit the links uh, between macroprudential policy and uh, and real estate taxation. I think it has been rather successful in, 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 that, uh, in that aim. Uh, we had three rich presentations from hans York and Denise and, and Dubrovko. Many areas of complementarity, um, but also some nuances, I, I thought, um, and even some recommendations um, on what I would call financial stability friendly tax policy. I think that was at the end uh, of your presentation, Denise. Um, so I have three questions that I'd like to pose to the panel. I have three questions that I'd like to pose to the panel, and after I've done that, then I'm going to um, open up for, for a general discussion. Um, so my first question concerns objectives. Um, Dubravko, you spoke about that at length. Uh, Denise had a Venn diagram which was showing <laughs> the overlaps uh, between real estate, uh, taxation, and macroprudential. Um, and my, my question is really about that, you know, that area of overlap in the Venn diagram. Where exactly is the overlap? I mean, we know um, taxes influence financial stability. I think that was in all of your presentations. Macroprudential, um, I think, also has the potential to influence taxation, um, too. Um, we explore that a little bit less. But I, I'd be interested to hear where, where, where you think exactly, you know, the two come into an, an, an alignment. Um, when, is, when, when are the objectives of tax policy and macroprudential policy aligned? Who wants to, who wants to start? <laughs> to well, I can try. I, I think they are aligned when um, we are in a period of uh, boom and when we need to tighten uh, credit growth, make sure that uh, it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, and then usually you need to use all available tools and uh, fiscal policy may, may be one of those tools. 
um, maybe not uh, really some of the main parameters of wealth and property taxation, uh, but rather some uh, less uh, um, central, more peripheral elements like this transaction tax. Uh, um, I know there is skepticism uh, and, and evidence about effectiveness of uh, measures aimed at uh, uh, preventing speculation in, in property markets. But I think you need to do something. Uh, one example uh, recently has been an uh, enormous rise in property prices in Vancouver and Toronto. Right. And there, uh, the authorities introduced uh, city-specific macroprudential measures uh, and also some special tech, tax measures. Right. So when uh, you really think, see that um, things are uh, not going in a good direction, you, you need to take uh, all, all available action. Uh -huh. Okay, I have the Vancouver example in my, in my slides tomorrow <laughs> actually as well. Uh, Hans-Jörg, any thoughts on this? Being from the OECD, I'm actually coming from, from, the, from the more structural side. I'm probably one of the, mainly the, I'm probably the only, let's say, fiscal, more dealing with public finance and fiscal issues than with the macro potential issues. So now coming from the public finance side, I would simply say um, uh, it's not the objective of fiscal policy to, to, to help macro potential, uh, macro -potential uh, objectives. Um, and coming from the from the uh, objective side or from the instrument side, um, it was already said. Monetary policy is a very blunt tool for uh, for macro brew. Fiscal policy might be a little bit better, but still, it's a blunt tool. My conclusion is, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a macro brew tool. Um, saying that, um, fiscal policy can still help macro potential objectives and actually seeing what, what uh, well-designed fiscal policy uh, well-designed fiscal policy especially in the housing market can do is that well-designed fiscal policy uh, or effective uh, efficient and, and equitable fiscal policy there is actually very few contradictions uh, with, with, uh, with fiscal policy helping macro, macro, potential, uh, macro potential objectives with one exception, we were already talking about that, is, is the capital gains tax. That might, there might be some tension mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. But well-designed fiscal policy actually supports macro-potential tools. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me quickly add on that. I mean, I agree with, with both uh, De Brock and Hans-Jörg. Uh, let me add to the structural side. A well-designed fiscal policy, we keep on talking about it, good fiscal measures are also um, stabilizers. They function yeah. as stabilizers. So if they are designed in the right way, they will help. Especially in boom situations, mm -hmm. they will help, right? And potentially in bust situations as well. So well-designed, macroprudential and well-designed fiscal would work together by acting as stabilizing measures. Yeah. Hans-Jörg, in your presentation, I mean, you showed, um, I mean, a, a number of examples where, in fact, fiscal measures can lead to the opposite of what you might have hoped for or expected or at least intuitively that I might have thought would have been would have been the outcome. Okay, you had the example of uh, the tax de deductibility of interest which leads to the expected outcome. Um, it's, it's essentially a subsidy. Um, but the property taxes, the stamp duties, what this does to the liquidity of the markets and so on, you had this as well. Um, I mean, I'm Interested to know, I mean, I, I, there was also, um, you had quoted the Swiss, Swiss National Bank paper we were discussing earlier. Uh, I had read the same paper um, in advance of this conference. Some of the, the, the findings from that paper were, were for me, counterintuitive. I mean, not what I expected, um, you know, the drying up of the market. Well, maybe afterwards it makes sense. Um, but it maybe we don't always necessarily think about all of the channels. I mean, there's a kind of a, a need to almost have a general equilibrium way of thinking about the way the taxes are influencing on many different channels um, in the economy. But I, maybe my, my, my bigger question 
Um, I mean, also from the work that all of you have done on, on reviewing the, the literature, does the literature tell us anything about, I mean, have there been instances in, in the past where taxation measures actually led to financial instability? That you have seen, mm -hmm. that you're Not aware of? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll actually, uh, I'm sure many people might have seen that paper. Uh, our, my colleague, Alexander Clam, uh, with a couple of other IMF colleagues in 2010, they looked all around and compare different tax systems and their financial crisis that countries experienced during the financial crisis, and they couldn't find any correlation in terms of that would be interpreted as a causal link. What they did find is that, like the debt financing, favoring debt financing, it can amplify the initial shock, but they didn't find anything as far as causation goes. I will go in the same direction. I think there is no, but really it's the first time I'm asking myself that question. Because, yeah, it's, it's so, it's <laughs> yes. so new. So. I know, uh, but I mean, I think and, you bring a good, and, a nice and so again, I mean, the, the, the Bank Lithuania really found, found a topical <laughs> issue and uh, it's, it's, it's really, it, it, makes, it makes you think. Uh, there might be cases uh, where property taxation was actually abandoned and there are a few cases where where um, OECD countries reformed property taxation but in a bad way. They abandoned it, uh, reduced it to to second or third third properties, uh, abandoned uh, owner-occupied um, housing taxation. Uh, we could look at, um, there is a case for Italy which changed several times. Uh, we might see whether that, that affected the uh, the, the financial stability and especially, I mean, I found it interesting what you said. I, I was talking about indebtedness and, and, and house prices and you made the, the relationship even clearer. We have, we have a strong bias towards, towards debt financing of, of home ownership and that's mainly because of the, non, of the deductibility of, of mortgage interests. Now looking at that more closely, we might find some cases where changes in, in, in the way uh, housing is taxed through the income tax system how that might affect um, uh, the stability or the house price volatility and then, then even which then translates into, into economic instability. Uh, but honestly, I'm not aware of, of mm -hmm. such cases and we really would have to look at some, some, some cases. No. Well, one tentative link maybe between real estate uh, based taxes and uh, fiscal general fiscal expenditure policy because we've seen uh, before this crisis a country like Spain had huge increase in, in, in revenue from real estate uh, taxation. Of course if they had uh, saved, put it aside, uh, it would not have uh, been a problem but also it's hard to resist so expenditure also increased. Uh, so. This, this is, I think, the, the link between the two. Uh, there is uh, often the illusion of uh, strong uh, state, uh, government balance sheets uh, during periods of uh, real estate booms. Uh, and the um, best way to avoid uh, the illusion that you have money to spend is to put it aside, recognize it as a uh, uh, windfall gain. I mean, one thought that I, that, that I had was, I mean, the tax deductibility of interest, for example. Um, you, 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 a number of you mentioned it. I mean, when you have that in existence and then you have a house price boom that may have even been supported by, by, by the tax deductibility of interest, does it mean that macroprudential policy in the end ends up having to be tighter than it otherwise would have had to have been? to moderate the cycle. And that was, I mean, a bit linked to that, to that question. But maybe I had a kind of a, a broader question um, on, on the whole issue of uh, coordination. Um, I mean, both Denise and Hans Jörg, you quoted in, in, in your slides, you had basically what I would call the Hippocratic Oath of tax policy. Uh, first, do no harm. <laughs> um, I, I think we, we established during this session um, that the measures tax policy measures can have financial stability implications. So the question that I would have is, um, you know, is, is there scope for coordination between fiscal and macroprudential authorities, um, in particular in the whole area of assessing the financial stability implications of tax measures? Uh, 
I guess we are all a bit skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, I mean, well, there's a, maybe there's a distinction between could it be done and should it be done. Yeah. Um, I, I guess with some of the structures that was uh, established after the crisis in terms of committees, in some of the financial stability committees, uh, fiscal authorities are sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, right. there are some institutional structures that could make it happen uh, in practice. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Just I, would, I would say the same thing. I mean, it mm. certainly makes sense if, if there's a big tax reform ongoing that the, that the tax department deals with, uh, well, talks to the central bank and then to, to, the, to the other, well, to other agencies and see whether it's the right timing, uh, whether, whether in the tax system, uh, what, what, what changes in the tax system might affect uh, uh, stability and, and, and volatility of, of, of the entire system. That's certainly useful. Um, so, in a way, it, 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 should, it should be done, yes, uh, in the sense that, yeah, you, you co of course you coordinate, like all government agencies coordinate among each other, at least they should do so, so again, they should do the same thing uh, with, with macro pro and taxation. Uh, whether it can be done, I think you have clear opinions about whether it can be done anyway, I mean, and mm. whether, whether uh, the, the different departments are reactive or responsive to, uh, to issues of macro prudential regulation. Mm. I mean, there are examples where there was, um, if you want, co cooperation. Uh, I don't know if somebody from Netherlands is here, may correct me. Uh, they have uh, reduced significantly the deductibility of uh, mortgage interest after this uh, yeah. last uh, mm -hmm. crisis. So, yes, it, it can happen. And... Uh, it should happen, but we should not be under the illusion that uh, uh, this is the way to go, that this is a, a low-hanging fruit that we haven't yeah. yet uh, yeah. Yeah. picked. Uh, I think that that's the main point. Okay, well, that's a fairly sanguine assessment. So, I would now open up uh, to the floor. Uh, any, qu any colleagues, any questions for the panelists? If, if you could state your name and your... Um, institution, I think that will be helpful, although in this case I do recognize the, the questioner, Reiner, <laughs> please. Thank you. Rainer Martin, John Vienna Institute. Um, I had a question on this regional dimension that was already uh, touched upon in the earlier stages of the panel. So I found the observation by Mr. Blöchliger very interesting that actually most of the taxation is regional or even local for real estate issues. And at the same time, for macroprudential policy, the regional dimension is very difficult for obvious reasons, spillover effects and so on. So my question to you would be, do you think that a well-designed regional or local real estate-specific tax system could actually help that gap? Or do you think it would have the same problems that macroprudential regional policy tools um, encounter? Thank you. I think that's a question yeah, for you. I think that, Andrew, that is, yes. uh, well, I, well, I don't know whether I have been very clear about that, but now I want to be clear and I would say yes. Um, a well-designed property tax system can indeed help, well, be both bring the additional tax revenues, be efficient, uh, equitable, and, um, and, uh, and, and especially un help not to undermine macro potential regulation. It means that the main, the main thing with property taxation is, is the, the, the valuation of the properties themselves. The current tax systems do, do not do that. They, they rely on, on indexes, indices. I mean, some countries have valuations going back to the 60s and the 70s. So what you actually need to have, um, uh, to have a, a functioning property tax system is, uh, is an evaluation process that puts the real value of property to, uh, that puts the real value on the, on the properties. And once you have this kind of, well, once you have this real property evaluation, the, the, the market value assessment of the property, then you also address the, 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 uh, the both the different values of property across the country. So you assess that property is more valued in Vilnius than, than somewhere outside uh, in, in the countryside. 
and also uh, somehow at least supporting uh, macro potential regulation because then you, you, you really help dampen the, the most, let's say, the most fervent price, uh, price increases which, which usually are, take place in, in the capital areas. House prices rise in the, in the capital area, so uh, also the property tax, taxes and the property tax revenues rise more in, in, in these capital areas. So yes, I think the well-designed property tax regime with market, with market evaluation is probably the, the, the best system you can have to, to support macroprudential macro uh, regulation. I saw another hand behind. Yes. Doris Brammer from the Austrian Central Bank. And I have a question because I think that all three of you pointed out that the uh, indebtedness of uh, households is a major problem, also to macro proof. And uh, according to the data we analyzed with a co author by myself, uh, Serena Fatika, we found out that according to the HI, uh, Household Finance and Consumption Survey data from the ESCB, only about 30% of uh, owner or occupation houses uh, take out a loan, a mortgage, so, which is quite a small level. And moreover, uh, mortgage interest deductibility is in most of the countries kept somehow, so it's not like a huge amount. That's why we found out that actually the distortions introduced by the non-taxation or the under-taxation of uh, owner-occupied housing is not just, or it's, it's only to a limited extent due to the mortgage interest deductibility, but the large problem is the under-taxation of equity, namely the non-taxation of imputed rents and the non-taxation of capital gains, which, includes, which induces huge distortions and leads, of course, to an overconsumption of housing compared to other assets. And this overconsumption, according to our calculation, leads to as, uh, amounts to as much as 30% of financial asset holdings of households in the euro area. And I think the bigger problem in this case is the undertaxation of the equity. And my question to you is, if you consider uh, that property taxes, in case uh, imputed rent taxation is not possible, could be a good substitute, if set correctly, to get these distortions right. No. Okay. Um, no, who wants to... No. Conferring amongst yourselves. Um, um, I think, uh, I mean, your argument uh, is logically consistent, uh, but there are differences across countries. L look at... Central and Eastern Europe, most of the housing stock was inherited from former socialist period. Uh, uh, workers got it through their enterprises, local communities, uh, and so on. Uh, how do you establish uh, in, in this uh, environment uh, some fair value of, of housing stock uh, and start uh, um, taxing Im imputed rent uh, it's, it's not so simple, I, I, I would argue. Um, then you have countries like Austria, where large uh, segments of population live in uh, uh, subsidized rent housing. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's a huge distortion. They, they enjoy a, a much higher value of housing services than they pay for. Um, Things are not so not so easy uh, when you start digging deeper. That, that, that would be my point. Yes, in principle, if you can tax imputed rent, uh, I know Switzerland does it. Uh, uh, some of these distortions you can think uh, uh, go away. But uh, even in Switzerland, there is now intense political debate about completely abandoning uh, imputed uh, uh, rental income taxation. Um, so practice, as Denis mentioned, is something quite uh, difficult to, to, to deal with. Did either of you want to add anything to that? 
Denise, but not sure you. whether I'm not sure whether household debt is really not a big, not a big issue. I mean, this is something which which mm. might be. I think it's there are the countries where it is a real issue and where indebtedness has become a critical factor in, in creating instability. On the imputed rent, yes, sure, that would be the probably the most the most elegant solution, especially that taxing property through through the imputed rent, or through the income tax system, makes the housing taxation more progressive in the end. I mean, one of the big disadvantages of, a, of, of property taxation is that it's, it's, it's not progressive. Uh, you can make it a bit progressive, but it's, it will always be less progressive than, than, a, than, an, than an income tax system. And um, in that sense, imputed rent, yeah, it would be the most elegant solution. The only thing is it's politically I think it even more difficult than, than property taxation. And uh, the Swiss case shows that even those countries that have it, and I think it's only five countries in the OECD that have imputed, imputed rent taxation, uh, soon will be four, because the Swiss opt out, um, uh, shows that that is, a, that is politically a very, delicate, at a very delicate area. Denise? Let me just add one sentence. I, I fully agree with what my uh, colleague said. Uh, let me just add one thing. The interest deductibility is not only an issue, obviously it's a big issue, especially in some countries when it comes to household mortgage debt, but it's also an issue with corporate debt. We need to keep that in mind in terms of you know, equity and debt financing. It distorts choices there too, and those distortions can be huge. And it has, they, they have implications for real decisions. They have implications for financial stability. So we need to, we need to think about them. Uh, I don't know the details of, of the Austrian system. It might very well be the, not the big chunk, but in general, I think uh, it just from a principles point of view, it just makes sense. Why, why are we making the choice for uh, economic agents, how they're going to finance themselves? We shouldn't be making that choice. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, you, you have a question? No, you're telling me the clock says six minutes and 36 seconds, but um, if you... <laughs> Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, Tigran Pogosian, IMF. Um, the panel usefully discussed three uh, policies, monetary, macroprudential, and fiscal. Uh, and um, in euro area countries, monetary policy in individual countries is no longer available. So my question is, uh, would the panel agree that in, in Euro area countries, the other instruments such as fiscal and macro potential uh, should be used more uh, intensively, let's say, uh, compared to um, non-Euro area countries? Okay. Who wants a crack at that? <laughs> my answer uh, is going to be short, please. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I would repeat, yes. <laughs> Yes, if you can. <laughs> so, we, I mean, one, one, I think, very interesting issue was touched upon in the keynote. Um, and this northwest corner, more and more of uh, property being financed by global companies over which monetary policy mm -hmm. really has not much in influence. There clearly, it's not just about macroprudential policy, but, but also about uh, taxation policy. But then again, you can get quickly into, into difficulties. Somebody may argue, well, you can't tax uh, um, foreign purchases of property at different rates from uh, local purchases, because this is a capital control in disguise. Um, Countries like Canada don't have such problems. They, they, they can do whatever they want, uh, but, but countries in euro area cannot unilaterally uh, impose differential tax rate on, on capital inflows to purchase property, uh, depending on uh, where um, uh, money comes from or depending even on, on whether money is domestic or, or, or foreign. So I think that that's an area that we all need to think uh, much more about. And also what you mentioned is the, the new technology for renting, Airbnb. It, it's a big issue. I mean, many countries uh, look very favorably at the moment at this kind of 
rentals, as, as if this were some sort of social policy, will help people uh, earn some a bit of money. Uh, or in, in tourism especially, yes, yes, we, you pay a low lump sum fee and then you let uh, uh, tourists come. Uh, and then people build uh, floor after floor of housing uh, uh, to rent uh, apartments. So I think that that's where I, I see uh, potential for some uh, really good uh, action on, on, on the fiscal side. Okay, we have time for one last question. Nico, sorry. Uh, there was Nico, a, Nico Vox from yeah. the IMF. Um, taking the point a little bit further that Tigran just made, um, should maybe a solution be an institutional way to accommodate or integrate the fiscal uh, authorities in the macroprudential world uh, through, for example, collaboration on the ESRB or in Europe or in other countries, uh, make them part of the framework. That way, uh, you could accomplish the goal that uh, they would be made aware that fiscal has financial stability consequences. That's a question to me, is it? <laughs> <laughs> open. There was a lady there that I think she had her hand up. It was a split hair between you and her, so I would feel a bit bad if she doesn't get a ch chance um, also. And um, maybe we can deal with the two issues Thank together. I'll try to be quick. Uh, Alina Van Bruggen, European Commission. Uh, I'm actually from Macro Pro Unit, and um, by all presentations that uh, you kindly gave us today, I had uh, more of Micro Pro question <laughs> popping up, so out of, out of my scope. Um, but um, what I caught out of presenters is basically fighting or stabilizing character of both macro pro and taxation policies instead of preventing. And uh, my micro pro question would be as follows. Uh, would you agree or disagree that there is capacity of forward looking policies, namely demography and mobility? And what I mean, if we continue with the uh, example of Netherlands, for example, after Second World War, the population rose by 10 million. That gives both liquidity to the real estate market and stability for mobilization. And uh, contrary, if we take, for instance, uh, Lithuanian or, or Latvian case, where I come from originally, um, mobility and uh, both birth rate and demography puts tremendous pressure, especially on outside Riga region. So would you agree that there is a place for both macro and tax policy to be more forward-looking and instead of fighting with consequences like um, introducing, I don't know, four, five, eights or, or borrow-based measures or whatever, to implement more of pro-cyclical in advance? Thank you. Any thoughts on, on well, either of those questions? That, that's a great question and it's not something that I thought about much. So I'll, I'll leave it to people who, who may know more. Uh, on, on Nico's question, one thing that concerns me, I mean, in principle, yes, one thing that concerns me is uh, fiscal policy has perhaps the most political element into it. So is that something that we also want to introduce to monetary and financial stability policies? That's, if we can figure that out, by all means. I would agree on that. I mean, it, it's useful if the tax department or the, FIS, the, the, fin, the Ministry of Finance that plans a big tax reform coordinates with, with other, with other, uh, with other, uh, with other organisations. Like, like if the education department plans a big reform, it coordinates with the economy, with the economics department and others. It's certainly useful. Coming from from the public finance side, yes. The, 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 somehow the lead is with the Ministry of Finance and, and they coordinate. That's, that's useful. That is useful and it should be done. On the, on the issue of the, well, the forward-looking, again, I, I come back to my point I, mean, what I made during the presentation, o open, up the, 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 open up the issue. I mean, in the end, we're talking about housing markets and, and there is demand and there is a supply and, and we have a supply issue. Mm -hmm. And all these, these issues you, you were talking about, demography, migration, uh, birth rates, uh, th th these, are, these, are, these, are, th these are questions that, that finally relate, relate to how, how, how do we cope with that? That's at the structural issues of the housing market. 
And before talking about micro and macro and all the other prudential things, I don't know whether there's something between micro and macro, but anyway, talking about all these, these, these tools to, some, to address imbalances, we should go to the source of these, mm -hmm. of these, of these imbalances. And, and these imbalances come from the fact, and it was mentioned several times, it's all this regulation, these, these urban planning issues, the, 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 the many, the many sometimes even small policies that, that inhibit, and especially in Eastern European countries where, where the, the spatial structure was frozen for very long, uh, movements that took place in, in, in Western European countries over decades, people moving from, the, from, the, from more rural areas to the, to the big metropolitan areas are taking place uh, very rapidly now in, in, and belatedly in, in, in Eastern European countries. But someone has to react to that. Someone has to devise the policies uh, that offer the possibilities for the housing market to, to evolve, to offer that supply. And I think before, as I said before, talking about tools to address imbalances, talk about the real issue, namely how do we get housing, not only for the 10% of the rich, but that issue you also mentioned, the affordable housing. It's not only a question of, of the overall economy, it's the question to whom are we finally offering, offering housing. Uh, is it affordable to everyone that, that looks for a place to work and to live? No, no I, I fully agree. I mean, what you seem to be suggesting is that fiscal policy should be um, on the watch for possible for signs of uh, bubbles emerging. Uh, there sh we should develop some sort of early warning system for the housing market. And when we see that um, house prices uh, rise above some threshold, fiscal policy jumps. They're uh, forward-looking. Before we get there, there are much more elementary issues and, and housing supply is, I think, a, a key issue. I fully agree. It's not just Eastern Europe, by the way. It's UK, it's, uh, it's US, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. Existing uh, property owners are able to block development in, in their area for various reasons. They have uh, uh, in, insider power uh, in, in terms of regulation. Uh, last year, I think there was a whole issue of a Journal of Economic Perspectives uh, on, on this. So, we should really solve these fundamental problems before uh, thinking about um, uh, more sophisticated ways that uh, fiscal policy could engage in, in, in dealing with these boom-bust cycles. Okay, um, so just, maybe just for me, the question that Nico posed, I think it was an important one. I mean, it's a, the policy dimensions and the, um, the input of um, people on the tax side, I think is important, how best that is done. Um, I mean, I, I think I would fully agree with what Denise said on this. Um, of all the policy domains, tax policy, fiscal policy is closest to the political process. And a lot has been done in Europe to completely separate the macroprudential policy decision-making process um, from the political process, um, the votes around the, around the table of the of the ESRB general board are primarily with um, governors of of the central banks. I mean, exactly for the same set of arguments that we all know for the separation of monetary policy from from the political process, which we have I mean, that was done because we know that when we do that, it becomes more effective. And the same goes, I think, for macroprudential policy. But that's not to say, and I think in some of the policy discussions, even that have been taking place recently, um, the importance of, of interaction with tax, the, the, the need for macroprudential policy to take account of what is happening in, in the tax domain is becoming increasingly, um, I, I, I think, um, clear to, to, to policymakers around the ESRB table. So, I mean, we'll have to look into you know, how that would be best how that would be best absorbed into the into the into the decision-making process that, that takes a place around that table. But I think it's a it's a valid question um, to raise. Okay, so I mean I think we have we ha we have run out of time. So I think there's the, really the, the last thing for us all to do is to express our appreciation to the three speakers for really the excellent um, presentations and also for the very um, rich contributions um, in this panel as well. Thank you to all, all three of you. Thank you very much.
come back to the hall, please? And we, so we could start with the second session of this conference. So with the second session, we will start the country experiences and the challenges they face with residential real estate related tax systems. And the moderator of this uh, session is Dubravko Michaljek, who is an advisor in the Monetary and Economic Department at the BIS. And I would like to introduce all the speakers in the row. So the first uh, speaker will be Catherine Grabeck uh, Monksen. Excuse me for my pronunciation if I messed it up. Um, who will be talking about real estate-related tax systems and macroprudential challenges in the in the Dan Denmark? Uh, she will be sharing the Danish experience. Then we will have uh, Peter Bambula, head of macroprudential policy division at the Polish Central Bank, and of course he will share the Polish perspective. And the third speaker is Tornbjorn. Hegerland, who is Executive Director of Financial Stability Department at Norges Bank, and uh, he will present the Norwegian experience. So, please, Katrin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and uh, also for me, thanks a lot to the organizers for um, inviting me to share the Danish experience on the interaction between residential real estate taxes and macroprudential policy. So, today I will talk about first uh, the Danish real estate related taxes. I will mention the main principles and what the, um, the taxes are in practice and also what challenges we have faced. And I'm pretty sure you will see that some of the issues that have been mentioned already today is some that we definitely have uh, experienced also in Denmark. I will then uh, talk about how the tax system has been taken into account in the macroprudential policy setting. And finally, I will uh, talk about the role of financial regulations, uh, since I suspected that we would probably be quite a lot of uh, central bankers and macroprudential uh, policymakers in the room today. So, turning first to the Danish uh, residential real estate related taxes. The fundamental principle uh, for taxing uh, capital investments is a symmetric tax system, uh, and that has been the case for more than 100 years in Denmark. And as concerns house ownership, uh, this implies that you tax uh, house ownership as other investment income. And in turn, this translates into taxing the implicit rental yield from home ownership and allowing for deducting expenses, which in this case is interest rate payments. As such, these principles could be argued to be fairly sound. Um, and as also has been mentioned earlier today. Um, before I talk about what the tax system then has been like in practice, I will just mention uh, two other uh, taxes that are relevant for the financing of a house purchase. The first uh, taxes is um, what you could call transaction uh, taxes. So in Denmark, buying a house will be as associated with the fees for registering the right of ownership and for registering the credit provider's collateral. These fees are paid by the buyer. Second, the tax payments on pension savings uh, are to a certain level deferrable until the time of withdrawal. And in a progressive tax system as the Danish, this incentivizes pension savings relative to other investments. Those were the principles. And before I turn to the challenges of the tax system, I just show, briefly show you also what the tax rates are in practice. The numbers are a few years old, but it gives you a broad sense. So, um, in 2014, the property value um, taxation was uh, on average 0.5% of the home value. And that translates into a 1.5% share of total tax revenue. This, is, this effective tax rate 
is nearly half of what it was 20 years ago. And the reason for that is a nominal tax freeze that was introduced in 2001. And I will explain that shortly when I talk about the main challenges of the tax system. Also, we have land value taxation, which a uh, share of total tax revenue is 2%. We have uh, interest rate deductibility, and um, taxation value of that amounts to around 2% of uh, total tax revenue as well. Finally, we have uh, transaction taxes, as I mentioned before, and these registration fees. They amount to roughly 2% of the home value. Now, in my... Um, uh, remarks as I go along now, I will concentrate on the property value taxation uh, with the tax freeze, the transaction taxes. Uh, we've discussed that also uh, earlier today. They are to the small side in Denmark, so um, we, did not, we would not consider they, them as being a main, major challenge uh, in the Danish system. So, the main challenge is the tax freeze that was introduced in 2001, and that was for the political economy reasons that have already been mentioned. Basically, it's really difficult to understand why uh, taxes are uh, increasing um, from owning a house. It has been uh, difficult to understand historically, and uh, as part of a um, political debate, uh, when we had a new government in 2001, it was agreed to nominally uh, freeze the taxes. And basically, this means that the tax rate was kept uh, as it is, but it was applied to the nominal home value as of 2001 and 2. So this has the effect that the more house prices increase, the lower is the effective tax rate in upswings, and conversely, in downturns, the effective tax rate will increase. In other words, the effective tax rate is procyclical. It also has the other effect that as house prices uh, tend to increase in the long run, and they did overall during the last 20 years, tax rates are also effectively eroded over time. Both of these elements uh, imply that the tax system will have a smaller dampening effect on house price swings today uh, than they had uh, roughly 20 years ago. This is uh, illustrated uh, in the chart uh, you see here on the right-hand side. So um, the blue line, the blue line, yeah, I'm just checking with the colors here, illustrates um, the household cycle uh, with the tax system as it is today. Uh, the good news is that in 2017, a political agreement was reached to abolish this tax freeze starting from 2021. And when this uh, ag agreement will enter into force, um, the tax system will again have a, a more dampening effect on the house price cycle than it uh, would have had with the tax freeze. Um, finally, the last uh, line here in the blue, the, the red line illustrates what dampening effect the tax system could have had if the tax rates have been at the level uh, that they were in 2001 before the tax freeze was imposed. The fact that the tax rates will no longer be have the same dampening effect is exactly due to the um, erosion of the effective tax rates over time. And there is no political willingness to return to previous levels before the tax freeze. So, coming now to this area of financial stability implication that has all been mentioned is somewhat more unexplored. What are these implications? Um, I listed here a few potential financial stability implications of the tax freeze. When I say potential, it's because that we did not necessarily see all these implications um, materialize uh, during the financial crisis in, in the 2000s, uh, but, but here is nevertheless a, an attempt to list uh, some of them. First of all, um, the continued house price increases, they may grow into self-fulfilling prophecies and speculative uh, behavior. We have a paper showing that 
And uh, with a lower dampening effect of tax rates, the, this increases the risk of price bubbles. Second, uh, we have also a, a Danish paper showing that there is a large propensity, propensity to mortgage house price increases, especially at the margin for those households who are constrained uh, on the LTVs. Which again makes a link to the to the financial system. Uh, it may induce a higher household uh, if, uh, balances as safe taxes may be used to purchase more expensive houses through the larger ability to service the debt. Um, the fourth point I would mention here is that we have a higher risk of technically insolvent households. And in turn, you could ultimately jeopardize uh, confidence in the value of mortgages uh, if uh, investors uh, become undoubtful whether um, the loan-to-value ratios uh, hold, hold true if you have large house price swings. So let me now talk... Let me now uh, talk about how uh, the tax system has been taken into account in the macrodential policy setting. First, uh, the Danish Central Bank has advised against uh, the tax freeze on a number of occasions in recent years. And I here show you a snapshot of headlines uh, in, in local uh, in Danish newspapers. So uh, they are naturally uh, in Danish. Don't worry about it, I will uh, go to the next slide and mention the scope for the macroprudential authority to talk about uh, the tax system. It's because the mandate of the macroprudential authority in Denmark is narrower. So the Danish Systemic Risk Council was established in 2013 as an advisory body with the comply or explain recommendation powers. Given the composition consisting of central bankers, finance uh, supervisor authority, ministries, and independent experts, it can act as a coordination mechanism. But it may not express opinions on the tax system, amongst other things. And this is what uh, the excerpt from the Legal Foundation on the Right says, that the Council will not be addressing developments in general economic policy, amongst others, tax policy. However, since the tax system does affect the risk outlook, uh, it is still being taken into account, and I will give you two examples. First, in uh, March 2015, the, can, the Systemic Risk Council did see a risk of uh, potential build-up of uh, risks in the system. House prices, in particular in the large cities, has been increasing uh, for some years by then. And the interest rates were historically low, uh, also in Denmark. And, uh, and with the tax rates that were still in place, we, we no longer had the, what we would call automatic stabilizers in the housing market, or at least they were diminished uh, dramatically. We, um, so what the council did is basically say in traditional central bankish language that in the absence of automatic stabilizers, uh, it then talked about a key condition for uh, sustainable economic development is that the housing market is not derailed um, despite the extraordinarily low interest rates. Um, my second example relates to, uh, more recently uh, when we have seen house prices flatten in Denmark. And uh, to counteract the voices expressing concerns about the flattening of these house prices and especially discussions about whether the political agreement on uh, abolishing the tax freeze uh, should be uh, reopened again, the council decided actually to uh, say that the, the slowdown in the property market is a welcome development, which is fine, which, which among other things is... Um, result of the forthcoming changes in the real estate 
with property taxation. Having said that, I will, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, uh, end my remarks on the role of financial regulation. So, historically, uh, household mortgages uh, has been a very standardized loan product in Denmark. Household, uh, houses would uh, typically be financed with a 30-year annuity with fixed interest rates during the entire span of the mortgage. In two, uh, but in late 90s, early 2000s, um, the mortgage bond rules were deregulated. Uh, first of all, adjustable rate loans were introduced, and second of all, uh, deferred amortization option for the first 10 years was also introduced. And what you see here in the chart on the left is the difference in the debt service expenses between these different loan types. Especially remarkable is uh, the, um, the lower debt service expenses that households will face if they choose a variable interest rate loan with, with deferred amortization. And as you see on the chart on the right, these uh, new loan types became uh, very popular very quickly. The, this deregulation was introduced during the upswing uh, and in the early 2000s. So the implications of this were that they actually uh, fueled the house price boom uh, quite dramatically. The chart you see here on the left are a few counterfactual uh, calculations, scenarios, what you, you call it. The blue line shows you the price, house price development as it actually took place, and the red line and the yellow line shows uh, counterfactual scenarios of if we imagine we had not introduced the option to choose uh, deferred amortization loans, and also if we had not introduced the option to uh, choose uh, adjustable rate loans. On the right, you see a counterfactual scenario if uh, politicians had not agreed uh, to freeze the property taxes in the early 2000s. And the point I want to make here is that while the property tax freeze was uh, not helpful in terms of uh, stabilizing house price uh, cycle. The financial regulation certainly was not helpful either. So, uh, basic, so to conclude, uh, while taxes may have a direct or indirect effect on t achieving the financial stability objective, we also have a large role in assessing the potential impact of changes in financial regulation and especially to ensure that if we do make changes, they're introduced in a prudential and not pro-cyclical way. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and for hosting the conference on a subject that is, as usual, uh, a timely one and a proverbial elephant in the room. Uh, let me start with standard disclaimer. What I say uh, are mostly or exclusively my thoughts and words, and they do not necessarily reflect the views held by the National Bank of Poland. Uh, let me start with uh, what we have just recently released. So the Financial Stability Council in Poland has issued in June 2019 its monetary policy strategy, where it uh, explains what are the main goals, priorities, uh, how we are going to deal with various situations, how we evaluate systemic risk and what types of instruments uh, we are likely to use and how we are going to use them. Uh, the core list consists primarily of capital-based instruments from CRR and CRD and from 
borrower-based measures. Now, there are no taxes or fiscal policy mentioned throughout the text in any of the excerpts. Now, uh, this is partly because one of the guiding principles that is uh, shown in the document is the principle to use as few instruments as possible in the macroprudential policy. The idea is to uh, improve or ease calibration, uh, ex post assessment, transparency, communication, and ultimately uh, the credibility of monetary policy. Now, if you confine yourself to short list of instruments, you would, likely, you would like to have the most effective ones. So do we believe that taxes are less effective than these capital-based or uh, borrower-based measures? Clearly not. Now, even uh, taxes are definitely have the power to affect economic outcomes, decisions, and as you see on the left-hand chart, uh, situation on the real estate market. Here, uh, we show dynamics rather than levels, uh, and uh, mm, uh, a cursory look suggests that uh, taxes have a power. Now, so it's not the issue of lack of eff effectiveness, it's rather the uh, uh, democratic mandate and where taxes are positioned. Taxes are at the very core of fiscal policy. And uh, as John Danielson and Robert McRae argue, uh, fiscal policy has upper hand over all other policies, uh, irrespective of the phase of the cycle, primarily because of its strongest democratic mandate, uh, that it can link itself directly to voters. Other policies follow. And Fortunately or unfortunately, the uh, macroprudential policy is the new key on the block, and it's not necessarily the, the next one. The issue and the challenge for macroprudential policy is that it's uh, mm, uh, um, concentrated uh, around uh, a very uh, distant future. It focuses on events that happen very rarely, and it's very difficult to evaluate its performance. Worse off, the benefits will likely materialize only over a very long horizon, while the costs would be felt in a short term. Uh, having this in mind and uh, having already a long list of untested instruments, it is no surprise that uh, authorities have not been eager to give uh, um, powers over property taxes to macroprudential authorities. Now, so this is the, is there therefore a situation where we believe there might be a room for um, tax initiative that is macroprudential in spirit, but not as a side effect, but as a primary goal? I believe there is, but you would have to have two sets of conditions uh, fulfilled jointly. First, you would need to have a tax structure or tax incentives that, are that result in distortions, bubbles or over indebtedness. And second, that the size of these distortions uh, results in high systemic risk. So these two things put together. Now, how it could look like. What you see here is an idea of a perfect storm loan uh, that is non-recourse, so you have jingle mail. It's non-amortizing, which eases the uh, everyday burden of uh, servicing cost. And as a cherry on top, uh, interest rates are tax deductible. This basically results in a free or a highly subsidized option on real estate prices. And it's a no-brainer to take as big loan as possible uh, for any individual. Such a structure is uh, already risky from a macroprudential standpoint without taxes, but the tax deductibility 
is the thing that really spins the wheel of the speculation and can result in a big systemic risk. So how do things look like? Now, different countries, uh, I don't think that any country is, comes, uh, is in the position that is portrayed in the slide. Some come closer, some are further from this uh, example. How does Poland look like? Well, uh, first, uh, there are some legacy issues in a property tax system in Poland. T uh, taxes in Poland are exclusively surface-based. Uh, this is a common feature that you see in many less developed economies. Part, uh, what is partly to blame is lack of credit uh, of land register or cadaster uh, that prevents an efficient imposition of value-based taxes. Second, property taxes uh, uh, were, or cadaster tax, were in the sidelines of policy discussions for last two decades, but they are such a politically sensitive um, thing that the tax system has been left unchanged in this respect from the 70s, uh, so 50 years already now. Now, there, are some, there is work going on uh, that will result in having a cadaster or uh, land register in electronic form by the end of 2020, so at least the prerequisite to have a tax is there. Now, from a macroprudential perspective, what is perhaps more important is the tax deductibility. Now, in Poland, there have been a, a tax relief due to housing investment in late 90s, and since two, between 2001 and 2006, there, was, uh, um, there, was, uh, there were tax deductions due to interest rate expenditure on mo or mortgage loans. They are no longer there. There are some uh, government policies uh, that subsidize um, housing investment or mortgage loans, uh, for example, for young families, but these are more targeted and with clearly predefined time horizon. So, but it is instructive to learn what happened uh, with the uh, tax deductibility of interest rate uh, um, uh, from mortgage loans. Uh, it has been introduced since it, in 2001 and uh, ended in 2006. Uh, following the accession to the EU in 2004, the European Commission has indicated that uh, the structure of uh, tax deductibility goes against the treaty. Only Polish citizens could deduct the expenditure from their uh, tax in Poland, whereas other EU citizens uh, who were working in Poland and paying taxes in Poland could not. Uh, and this structure was, uh, according to the uh, European Commission, against the, the, um, the treaty. Now, the government uh, could have done two things, expand the deductibility uh, or do something different. So, the government has decided to scrap the deductibility altogether from, for everyone. And there was no deductibility um, at all and blame it on the EU. Uh, now, uh, I think that the government should be given a lot of credit, from a, at least macro prudential perspective to it, for the timing of this decision was perfect. Following the accession to the EU, we have witnessed a rapid financialization, and on the left-hand chart you see the, uh, how the sh uh, volume of mortgage loans has increased in Poland, from almost non-existent to perhaps not substantial by European standards, but the expansion was very fast. Now, uh, as history teaches us, the rapid expansion of credit is often a harbinger of problems, and with 
tax deductibility going through 2007 and 2008, uh, we might have ended up with problem of systemic proportions rather than, and, and we have not. We have averted the financial crisis uh, without experiencing uh, substantial slowdown, uh, uh, not to mention uh, uh, a negative growth. Uh, to add to it and to complete the picture, uh, the prices uh, in Poland following the EU accession have more than doubled during the next four years, between 2004 and 2008. Now, with tax deduct deductibility, and um, uh, that would uh, f likely fuel more loan taking, this would have been uh, more severe. Following the crisis, the prices, and in nominal terms, the prices have been relatively high. This is in Polish Zloty, so you, ha you have to roughly di divide it by four to get price in euros. So that was around two and a half thousand euros in Warsaw, average price uh, in Warsaw in 2007-2008. At that time, that was not far from prices in Vienna. And in real terms, that got you real expected. Following the crisis, the situation in Poland has cooled off. The prices have fallen by around 20%, but without large macroeconomic repercussions. They have remained stable throughout the last years and only started to pick up recently. But in real terms, they stay well below, below previous peaks. Uh, on the right chart, uh, apologies, this is not, these are not prices, but house price determinants are one of these. And this is number of apartments uh, against uh, GDP per capita, uh, where uh, you see that the housing availability or quality of housing in Poland in um, uh, triangles is below what you find in other countries. So there is, uh, there is expected to be some additional pressure just from it on house prices, as the availability is not that ample. However, we have not seen it so far. Now, looking, putting the things together, what we have in Poland is relatively convenient uh, well, and safe situation. First, uh, and, uh, to, uh, and referring to what Henrik has mentioned, uh, most credit uh, mortgage loans are exclusively issued by uh, resident banks. There is no non-banking finance. So it's easy to, uh, to affect and to monitor. Second, and perhaps most importantly, what we see in banking practices is rather safe. The, all loans, as for now, are with recourse. They are amortizing. And uh, the interest rate expenses are not tax deductible. So in the, the incentive structure is not perverse. We do not see a strong case for misaligned incentives on the mortgage market. All in all, well, we, it's difficult not to agree that taxes do matter, and do matter a lot for macro potential policy. But uh, uh, we do not have them mentioned in the strategy partly or primarily because they are so much at the core of the fiscal policy. It would be good once uh, tax reforms are contemplated that financial stability uh, considerations are uh, included so that we do not concentrate on short-term benefits and having uh, large and unwanted long-term costs. Uh, how the, with this in mind, I would see a scope for uh, macroprudentially driven uh, tax initiative, but it will require uh, uh, two sets of conditions. That all, the already existing taxes would have to provide uh, misaligned incentives, and we could show that these incentives result in a high systemic risk, and we could uh, pin down the costs pretty neatly. Luckily, this is not the case we have now in Poland. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, so uh, before I start, I would uh, thank the organizers for the uh, invitation to, uh, to come here and participate and, and talk, and also thank the organizers for uh, uh, hosting this conference on a sort of an interesting and timely topic. Uh, these conferences, which is the third in uh, in row, uh, I think uh, what what they share is that they 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 put on the agenda a very important uh, topic that we are able to discuss in full over over two days, and also topics that are not typically covered in the regular meetings that we uh, uh, where we, where we convene. So thanks to the organizers for that. I'm been at uh, two of the conferences. At the first one, I was far away from central banking. So uh, for the record, Thomas, I have full attendance uh, so far. <laughs> so uh, the, the questions of whether and how tax policies affect uh, financial stability and in particular risk stemming from real estate markets how they should be taken into account when designing macroprudential policies relating to real estate markets or also whether uh, the tax policies should tax policies should be considered part of the macroprudential toolbox that's part of a more general or bigger uh, discussion on of the limits to macroprudential policy. What should we aim for and which tools should we use? Real estate and real estate markets are at the top of the mind of most people, uh, working on and concerned with financial stability. In this audience, it is not necessary to uh, explain why. Macroprudential measures put in place in different countries are often centered around real estate uh, markets and the build-up of debt related to real estate. The ambition, or at least the perceived ambition of macroprudential and financial stability policies related to real estates, and in particular residential real estates, differ across countries. From, on the one hand, building resilience in banks and households via uh, controlling credit growth or the credit cycle, or even to steer house prices in a desired direction. The level of ambition for macroprudential policy also has implication for the relevance of tax policies as a policy tool in this respect. It is fairly obvious that the tax system may have big implications for real estate markets and the decisions of individuals and firms related to real estate. As a key factor of production, provider on consumption services and also an important asset and hence vehicle for wealth accumulation, real estate markets real estate assets are affected both directly and indirectly by many aspects of the tax system. So the key questions, key, or some of the key questions we must ask are how does the tax system with its direct and indirect incentives affect financial stability? What role should macroprudential and financial stability issues play in the design of tax systems and tax policy? And should tax policy be considered a part of the macroprudential toolbox? Before I continue, I should put forward a disclaimer. Uh, Norges Bank has not expressed any strong views on the tax system and tax policies in Norway. And any views, direct or indirect, on tax policy presented here should be considered as my own and not necessarily reflecting those of the Central Bank of Norway. Norges Bank, in our policy work, we definitely acknowledge that tax rules affect the functioning of the economy and also may affect important policy objectives for the central bank. Then also the efficiency of, policy, of our policy tools used to achieve these ob objectives. Tax rules may directly or indirectly affect our policy decisions or advice, but we do not actively participate in the, the policy debate on taxation. So, for the remainder of this presentation, I will sort of give a brief uh, overview of the parts of Norwegian 
tax system relating to real estate and briefly discuss how it may affect financial stability risks. But, but with respect to residential real estate, Norway is characterized as a country with a high share of home ownership, more than 80% of households own their own, own house, high and increasing household debt. The current number is about two, the household debt is 230% of household disposable income and high house prices with recent periods of steep increases. And there are reasons to believe that part of this development has been stimulated by features of the tax system. Also, a number of macroprudential measures have been taken to contain the risk from the housing markets, that floors on risk weights. CCYB has been increased in several rounds, but on the background of uh, increasing house prices and debt, now it's 2.5% from the end of this year. And borrower-based measures has been uh, introduced first as guidelines, then as regulations, which has been gradually tightened with a broad set of restrictions on both LTV, DTI, DSDI and amortization requirements. The Norwegian tax system has been through several reforms over the last decades. The main focus of these reforms and, and, and how, how on the design of the tax system is that the tax system is, well, it, what it does is to raise the funds necessary to finance govern, government expenditure, creating as few distortions as possible, promoting an efficient allocation of resources. The underlying principle, or at least the ambition of recent tax reforms, has in this way been to aim for a tax system with a broad tax base covering all types of activities, incomes and assets and they should be all be subject to taxation so that taxes may be kept low with uniform rates to minimize distortions. There are of course other taxes that are uh, other taxes levied with a Pigovian motivation to correct for externalities in particular environmental and climate related issues. When I go through elements of the Norwegian tax system in a moment, some of you may reflect that the ambition of minimizing distortions with respect to raising revenue have not been completely fulfilled. I may agree with you with that, on that reflection. But also, in addition to efficiency concerns, the tax system have some elements of redistribution and also have some features probably best characterized as industrial policy. Financial stability concerns have not been a key part of the considerations when designing the tax, the tax system. So now let me go through some of the uh, tax system with, with related to real estate. Property taxation, wealth, rental income and also uh, taxation related to uh, housing transactions. Property taxation is levied on the municipality level in Norway. There is no central or state um, uh, property tax. So each municipality decides whether property tax should be levied. I think 75% of municipalities have a, a property tax. Uh, and what you typically see is that the uh, the existence of a property tax is positively correlated with the number of uh, holiday homes uh, in uh, in the municipality. So it's easier to levy a tax on those not voting at, at municipality elections. So political economy comes into play. The absence of a national property uh, property tax than is the municipal tax makes it more of a sort of a revenue financing uh, of a revenue financing uh, device for municipalities, limiting the possibility for sort of an efficiency enhancing tax reform where property tax and could be uh, could replace more. Uh, distortionary uh, distortion taxes of the, on the national level. Uh, 
This property taxation is based on an assessed value that can be as high as its market value and, and there's a rate between 0.2 and 0.7% of the assessed value and it can also uh, opt to levy property tax only on the highly valued, uh, highly valued properties. Wealth taxation uh, in, in Norway is assessed on the basis of net, net wealth, gross de wealth less debt. Wealth comprises all kinds of uh, all kinds of assets, and there's a basic deduction of uh, one and a half million uh, Norwegian kroner, around 160,000 euros per person, depending on tax class. The wealth tax rates in uh, uh, in 2017 is in total point a little less than uh, little less than one uh, percent, uh, where something goes to the municipality and 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 some share goes to. to to the state, but is nationally determined. In general, net wealth is estimated as uh, market value of, of the assets. For some types of assets are eligible for a valuation discount, equities uh, get a 25% re, uh, rebate, for instance, uh, etc. And deposits, debts, etc. is valued uh, at 100% of, uh, of market value. But if and debt is is sort of distributed among the the, the different different assets. And if uh, if if you have an asset with with a, with a, with a rebate, also uh, the share the proportion of debt related to that asset is reduced uh, accordingly. But prop. Um, uh, Primary housing uh, have a very special treatment in, in, in uh, the wealth taxation. Value of primary housing should not be more than 25% of its market value, while the debt it can be deducted 100%. A holiday home should also be more, not more than 30% of its market value. That's why you have so many holiday homes in, uh, in Norway. Tax value of secondary housing, that has been tightened over the last years. It should not, not be more than 90% of the value. And market value is estimating using information of building year, et cetera, from, and, and house price indices. If that estimated uh, value is too high, you may complain and you may get, a de you may get it reduced according to, uh, to uh, transaction values. Rental income. Rental income tax on housing depends on the kind of housing the owner, owner lets, how much of the housing the owner lets, and how the owner uses uh, the housing. Profits, uh, rental tax, profits from, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from rents will be taxed as capital, capital gains income if, it's, if it is uh, eligible for tax, taxation. Short time, uh, short time letting is uh, if, if you if you uh, if you let uh, letting for less than 30 days, you, you it is it is taxed. But but some of uh, uh, s there 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 is a there is a basic deduction. So if Airbnb uh, uh, Airbnb rentals, if they uh, if they report their incomes, the, it will this income will be uh, be taxed. If you uh, but the major part of rental income is not subject to taxation. If the owner lets less than half of her home, rental income is tax-free if the rental period is longer than 30 days or if you rent, rent out less than half of your house, even less than half of your house for the whole year or the whole, whole house left the, less than half a year. So it's very, uh, for tax purposes, it's, it's very uh, favorable to, to have sort of a small apartment in, in the basement of a house that you, that you rent out to, to a student, etc. That will be completely tax free. H housing purchases, there's a stamp duty of 2.5%. Uh, their income or income uh, mortgage interest rates are deductible with 22, 22%, and there are also favorable savings for young people below the age of 34. You're allowed to save 2,600 2, euros a year, uh, earmarked as housing equity, and then you get a 20% reduction in your tax, not in your income, the year you save, and you may save up to 300,000 years. This is this is. This scheme is, uh, is designed to 
make younger people earn equity to, uh, to buy their own house, but it, it also affects the taxation of housing. Housing sales, uh, capital gain tax of housing sales is 22%, but most housing sales are except, exempt for taxation. If you live in, if you, basically if you sell your house that you have lived in and uh, live, lived in for more than one year, then you, you, you don't pay tax on, 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 on selling, selling your house. So there has been the, 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 these aspects of the tax system reflects that there has been a broad political census that households should own their own homes. Taxation related to purchase of sale of real estate has been developed to that end. But there is considerable debate on property tax and wealth tax in Norway. And as in many other countries, it's from an economist point of view, property tax and also wealth tax uh, have some attractive characteristics, but it's hard it's a hard sell politically. The mere existence of property tax makes it less attractive to invest in housing, but low property and wealth tax rates stimulate investment in housing compared to other assets. And also, uh, uh, and also, uh, also this the wealth wealth taxation also stimulates build up of debt and purchasing purchasing of, of residential uh, real estate the the interest rate deduction has been reduced over the years and has some somewhat reduced the incentives to debt finance uh, home purchases so uh, summing up as this quick tour of relevant parts of the norwegian tax system is shown there are a number of elements that favors investment in real estate and in particular owner-occupied residential real estates. This applies to both ordinary homes and holiday homes. The effect of this has probably been that a larger, larger share of household saving has been allocated to real estate and not to other assets. Hence, that more capital has been allocated to housing because of the favorable tax treatment. It may also have, con may also have contributed to the build-up of debt in Norwegian households. And it's quite clear that the tax system in Norway may have financial stability implications. Implicitly and explicitly, this is taken into account when Norges Bank gives advice on macroprudential measures. The financial stability consequences is also something that should be kept in mind when designing tax systems. However, I think one should be aware of the risks of overburdening the tax system. As I said, the main purpose of the tax system is to raise revenue to finance government spending. For a given level of spending, this revenue should be raised in a way that minimizes the distortions of resource allocation. Correcting for externalities, taxation may improve upon resource allocation if externalities can be properly identified, quantified and targeted with implementable taxes. Other attempts to use the tax system to solve societal problems and promote good causes of various sorts may lead to unintended and unforeseen negative effects on resource allocations, making government fundraising more expensive. There may be many good, argu good economic arguments moving to more property taxations while reducing uh, taxes with uh, more distortions or to reduce the favorable treatment of housing in wealth taxation, etc. But the arguments for this is mostly, are mostly related to efficient resource allocations and or uh, distributional concerns. Financial stability, with all due respect in this, uh, in this room, uh, is of second order importance, even if uh, the financial stability arguments may point in the same direction. Therefore, in my personal view, financial stability concerns should be taken account, into account when designing the tax system, for example, when it's reformed or renovated from time to time. 
but one should be careful not to attempt to use the tax, tax system to counter the financial stability risks of the year and of the quarter. In addition to the risk of overburdening the tax system, it is also difficult to get the timing right. Norges Bank has stated that macro prudential policy should not aim to fine tune the markets. Policy tools such as borrower based measures should be considered as structural measures and not be changed too frequently. This argument applies even more to tax policy. Thank you. Okay, so Katrin, Piotr, Torbjorn, thank you. I don't have to flip slides, so I won't make a mess again, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, so uh, what struck me listening to your presentations is how even uh, uh, countries that have uh, by all standards, excellent governance arrangements uh, um, in fiscal policy, like Denmark, uh, um, Norway, Poland. Um, um, even they don't think that uh, you could use uh, tax policy uh, for um, to help a bit macroprudential and and and. Uh, uh, monetary policy. Uh, another thing that struck me was um, that um, you tax property very lightly. The uh, regime is very li lenient toward uh, property taxation. What's the reason? Uh, is it because you tax income so uh, at, at such high rates? Uh, um, is it that polit from the political economy point of view, um, a decision was made, oh, okay, we, we are already taking 50% uh, of, of your income in taxes, uh, so let's not overdo it, let's not put even more uh, burden uh, through um, uh, property taxes. Uh, so th th that would be my uh, uh, first question, why this um, reluctance to, uh, from the fiscal perspective, uh, uh, use the potential to generate more revenue, even in countries that have uh, good governance arrangements that could uh, uh, use this uh, potential. I could uh, just uh, try to answer uh, on, on the part of Norway. I think we have, we have, we have the, the debate in Norway as well. Well, the, the, the obvious uh, uh, the, the standard e economics argument that, that uh, ta taxing property uh, property tax have some some good good characteristics with its uh, immobility, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, possibly creating less distortions than other taxes. But I think uh, so you sort of ask why why uh, there. Were, Taxation of property is uh, so lenient in Norway, from, from at least from an international perspective. Uh, I think uh, there 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 has been um, policy in Norway to uh, stimulate people to own their own uh, home, and many uh, over say a generation or two, uh, a large share of the population has sort of. Uh, Moved not necessarily out of poverty, but at least uh, gaining gaining in, uh, in 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 economic position and owning their own house has has been sort of a vehicle uh, towards that. So there's there is there is political uh, resistance mm. towards uh, too harsh taxation on on property. Mm -hmm. Catherine. 
I think the, uh, the reason in Denmark is uh, in a way very similar in, in Norway in the sense that it, this is a political, uh, how do you say, uh, judgment in terms of how they want to raise uh, tax revenues. Uh, it's not the uh, recommendation of economists. <laughs> to uh, to have uh, such a uh, low uh, taxation uh, but it's uh, it's really really difficult to understand uh, actually when we go back in time we used to have a system of uh, imputed rent taxation and uh, but it was uh, so difficult for homeowners to understand uh, why they pay tax of a uh, rent that they don't uh, earn it was uh, so actually we did have a change basically in, in the tax system then saying okay well then we're going to change the property tax instead and it was a one for one change and so to say so it didn't uh, increase or reduce the revenue they changed the the framing of it so to say and that uh, worked for uh, a, a few years but then as, uh, as I just uh, demonstrated we had a, a political mm -hmm. debate about um, that your tax payments increase year over year, despite the fact that you don't f feel it in, in, in the cash flow. Uh, so, so, so that's, uh, I think that's the main reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, even now when we have uh, actually uh, have, have finally reached a political agreement uh, to return to at least uh, a tax system that is not uh, pro-cyclical, um, it has been explicitly stated that the tax revenues should not go up from uh, go, uh, moving to this uh, more stabilizing tax system. And in case tax revenue increases, it will be reflected in the in lower tax rates. Mm -hmm. So it's a very explicit ceiling to tax revenue here. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that's basically political economy issue in Poland. Uh, uh, there was discussion, there is discussion about cadaster uh, mm. property tax for already 20 years, but uh, not much has, has changed. And this is perhaps uh, not because of technical difficulty of mm -hmm. not having the cadaster, because with political will you would have it quite uh, soon. It is perhaps the, mm, the potentially regressive nature of property tax. When you look at uh, wealth of uh, households across Europe, from Household Finance and Consumption Network survey that we, that we do, you see that in, uh, this is housing equity uh, that, is, that constitutes the primary source of uh, household wealth. Uh, however, among the very wealthiest households, this constitutes a smaller proportion mm -hmm. of overall wealth compared to other households. So with, uh, if you have elderly women living in a, a city center that you frequently have in, in Poland, uh, she lives in an apartment that was uh, not bought, but perhaps uh, given to her following the transformation, uh, she will not likely have means to service the, the tax based on, on property value. And I think this is part of the reasons why there is a little will on political side to alter it. Uh, still looking at uh, how much revenues are, uh, is re uh, how much revenue is raised through po property taxes in Poland is relatively high in, in, in the region. Uh, perhaps it would have been better with uh, other system, but the political implications are that it's, it's difficult to, to implement. Mm -hmm. Of course, one could argue that it is precisely in um, uh, cases that you describe where urban properties are owned by elderly people um, who don't have uh, large recurrent income, that tax proper, that, um, taxes could be used to incentivize these people to move out and, and for uh, higher income younger people to move in uh, the, the city. So one, one could turn the argument <laughs> around as well. But um, I know that the most dramatic example of, of this um, uh, implicit poverty trap through property taxes is Japan during the housing bubble in, in, in the 80s uh, and, and early 90s when literally uh, many households went bankrupt because they could not no longer pay their uh, property 
tax liability. So that's a reminder to us of the limits to uh, property taxation as a way to generate uh, revenue. Um, one, one other uh, thing that came to my mind when I was listening to your uh, presentations, but also earlier uh, uh, discussion, is the following. We all seem to think that um, macroprudential tools and property taxation uh, are there to be used when prices are rising. It's uh, somehow instinctively think you should restrict uh, uh, increases in uh, property prices through these tools. What, what about the slump in property prices? Shouldn't these uh, tools be symmetric when uh, you have uh, prolonged uh, decline? Uh, um, to what extent uh, do, do you think uh, one should use uh, macroprudential tools and, and uh, property-related taxation to, to help prop up uh, the property market? Well, well I think that uh, the, the time lag of even with political will is such that it will not necessarily be efficient. But perhaps more importantly, uh, mm, uh, the, uh, we should not... Uh, uh, are we sure that all house price increases are bad? Well, if they mm -hmm. would be bad, we should fight all of, all of them. Uh, some of the bubbles may be actually beneficial, real bubbles in terms that they alleviate uh, inefficiencies uh, in the economy. Uh, if there are credit constraints and there is a bubble, it eases the degree of uh, credit constraint and could ultimately be uh, wealth improving. So I, I would rather be hesitant in uh, being very uh, active mm -hmm. on this front, even if that would be an option, which I think it's, it's not really an option mm -hmm. from a political mm -hmm. perspective, because tax uh, reforms happen very frequently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I, I think uh, tax rates, if you have a flat tax rate, they will automatically serve as uh, automatic stabilizers in this sense, and they will be dampening uh, during the upswing and, uh, and also uh, in the downturn, the effective tax rate will, be, uh, will, will work um, uh, how to say, um, as, as a country cyclical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, I would fully agree. Uh, fine tuning is uh, is very tricky. We uh, know it when we're doing macroprudential policy. It's uh, the same in uh, f f for f for fiscal policies. It's uh, very very tricky to figure out exactly where the economy uh, is uh, as you go along. So the more I mean, in, in Denmark at least, we have a very strong fiscal system of automatic stabilizers that we think works very, very mm -hmm. well, generally speaking. Uh, and and I would also uh, personally, my personal view in terms of macroprudential policies, uh, I think a lot of these instruments uh, should uh, serve uh, more structural terms, as uh, as you also uh, mentioned. And, and, and I think, in a way, they do. Uh, Borrow-based measures that are set relative to income, they will be constraining during the upswing uh, and during the downturn, uh, depending on how they have been calibrated. But if they have been calibrated more or less to prevailing uh, market standards in normal times, in downturns, they will likely not be binding because you will have the market standards themselves basically determining how the credit willingness of, of the banks. Mm. So in that sense, I think that they could also serve as automatic stabilizers in the fiscal, in the financial system. Mm. And, uh, and, and for sure, it is uh, very tricky to find the right timing of, of, of introducing these instruments. And uh, in, if you have a system where you need to convince policymakers to do this, as you have in Denmark, where it is not the financial uh, supervisory authority or the central bank that sets the instruments, it's uh, also certainly important that uh, you try to build the system that is 
that robust over time, uh, which also serves the credit institutions well. It's very predictable which rules they are uh, they, they have to uh, adjust to and abide to. Yeah, I, um, I, I I agree. I think in terms of uh, in terms of tax system, I think the uh, a well designed tax system has mm -hmm. a large uh, is is very much has many automatic uh, stabilizers then also working uh, sort of symmetrically in an uh, in an upswing uh, and a downturn and it may uh, and in general I think one should be careful in um, sort of going down the road of of, of using tax uh, policy discretionary in, 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 in various areas in, in specific circumstances. Because if, if you sort of open that door, well, financial stability, that's our area, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's so important. So we have to have some uh, extra measures here that we use in downtown. Well, there are numbers of uh, other fields with, uh, at least we think, slightly less convincing arguments. But once you open that door, then, uh, mm -hmm. then you can have a quite different tax system before you, before you know it. In terms of macroprudential uh, measures, I think uh, uh, I agree with this. These are measures that should mainly be structural and have the aim of building, mm -hmm. uh, building resilience. Uh, there are some counter-cyclical macro-prudential measures, mm -hmm. namely, the, for instance, the counter-cyclical uh, capital buffer. Capital buffer. Uh, we state in Norges Bank that we have a somewhat asymmetric view on sort of the uh, uh, raising of the buffer in upturns and, and, and releasing it. The key, aspects, the key aspects would be the functioning <coughs> of the, in the economy and in terms of the CCYB bank's ability to also mm. to uh, support lending in, in a downturn. Uh, I, would, I would also think that that, that, would, that would in some sense apply to uh, say borrow-based uh, measures, mm. clearly an asymmetric uh, view, but, but mostly these, uh, these measures should be, should be structural and probably, as you said, not probably someone would not be binding also also in a, in a downturn. Yeah. Uh, I'll have just one more question before turning to the audience. Uh, one issue that we have been um, avoiding, um, a bit like cat walking around the hot uh, uh, milk, is land taxation. M most of land, mm -hmm. urban, mm -hmm. agricultural, uh, I mean, most of increase in property values arises from uh, increase in value of land, urban land for construction. Um, Norway and Poland are big countries. Uh, Denmark is not so small either. Uh, how do you... Uh, how, are there any issues with taxation of, say, agricultural land? Uh, how, how is that treated? Uh, uh, I know in Poland, surface-based, <laughs> not value-based, uh, but uh, is this an issue in, in political discussions, in economic discussions about uh, property taxation? Um, it's not uh, specifically in terms of agricultural uh, taxation as such, uh, but uh, we do have land taxation mm -hmm. in Denmark uh, in addition to the property taxation. Uh, the property tax is set nationally, the land tax is set uh, locally. And uh, there we also had uh, some uh, distortionary examples to put up with uh, during the last 20 years. Uh, I just presented the main challenge uh, uh, before. Um, I, I would say, in a way, the, the issue is a bit the same. Uh, that you, yeah, I mean, it's a liquidity question for, for some households. Uh, and. Uh, and then you have an equalization question also. We have huge uh, equalization measures across the country from richer municipalities to m municipalities with mm -hmm. uh, lower, generally lower uh, income households and so on. And so it's, uh, it's, 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 tr it's more tricky to, to, to do anything about uh, this actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
I think in, uh, there is not, not a big debate in, uh, mm -hmm. in Norway. It, it, could, it could have been. I think the uh, general uh, thing is that land values are taxed as capital gains on, mm -hmm. upon realization. Uh, well, if, if you're mm -hmm. so, so lucky that you, uh, that you have a, a forest uh, property close to an uh, alpine uh, resort and you're allowed to... Uh, Develop that into into cottages and or uh, or sell sell the land for that and then then you will be uh, mm. uh, taxed for that capital uh, mm. capital gain. But there is uh, to no or at least very limited extent uh, valuation or uh, differentiation of the valuation of land uh, to. Uh, uh, along that dimension before it is developed. Mm -hmm. Well, in Poland we have surface based and it's uh, so the first way to go would be to perhaps change it to mm -hmm. value based. Currently there are different rates for uh, agricultural land, for forested areas, for lakes, for housing and for commercial use. But they are not uh, value mm -hmm. uh, related and this can distort uh, uh, incentives severely. So mm -hmm. uh, um, perhaps uh, one uh, side note, uh, in Poland there is a uh, uh, large population living in, in the countryside uh, as farmers, and therefore this would add uh, to the uh, political nature mm -hmm. of the debate of how it will, uh, such taxation would, uh, reform would evolve, if, if there would be any. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions, please. Yes, please. And then there. And Thanks a lot. So <clears throat> my name is Eugene Terano. I work for the uh, ECB, the Macroprudential Division. And um, since this is a sort of a country experience based panel, I would have sort of a pragmatic sort of policy coordination question, actually, two. So, I guess uh, we've heard so far that you know real estate uh, taxation regimes are you know older, complex, uh, you know oftentimes with localized decision making, and in often case in, in many cases the mandates are clearly defined. We we heard the case of Poland where you know basically there's there isn't much room to discuss. Uh, I suppose from um, on the side of uh, fiscal policy implications for for macro and financial stability. So in practice, from, from your experience so far, how did the dialogue take place between macro approval authorities and fiscal authorities? I mean, even at the technical level, if not in sort of a pure public fora, and related to that, what can be done to actually improve this dialogue going forward? Yeah. Thanks. Let, let's collect a few questions and then uh, we, we can turn to this. Thank you so much. I am Francesco Zollino from Bank of Italy. I also would like to thank all the organization because I collected so many interesting reflections since the start of the meeting. But I just like to point out the one that I consider the more general, uh, more general in terms of our approach to macroprudential. So, if the macroprudential remit is mostly related to the, to make a condition to avoid the sudden reversal in the property prices, I wonder whether we we have learned today how we should treat the fiscal the taxation, the property taxation within a structural model by which we can understand which is the misalignment of house prices. So uh, it's important perhaps to invest in, to, in order to better understand uh, which are the channels by which uh, the taxation can affect the equilibrium in the house prices. So either more indirect effect or, in, that, in my opinion, more in terms of indirect effect, so through the macro general economic. It affects more in terms of affordability, so demand for dwelling, or more in terms of investment purposes. And also it is mostly a source of vulnerabilities, or it is an amplifying factor. I think that we need to understand uh, if, for example, we should consider any deviation uh, of the, on some standard in, in taxation as the source of our concern. So I think if you, we can design an efficient taxation system, perhaps it should not be a matter of macroprudential concern. Uh, on the contrary, when we see some shocks, some reforms that perhaps are pro-cyclical, perhaps not so well understood also in terms of the economic efficiency, so I wonder whether we should try to elicit, which is the 
the parts of the, the taxation system that could hurt the more the, the stability conditions. More or less, you know, uh, the discussion about how fundamental is the low interest rate nowadays. And so how, how much is fundamental uh, the, the kind of taxation you observe? Because I am, traditionally I use taxation as one fundamental driver of the equilibrium industrial market. So I would like mm -hmm. also to understand your opinion, also because if you understand we have a clear picture on the channel of transmission, we can make the kind of simulation effects that Catherine was referring, and to discover, for example, that taxation is a, a minor impact, uh, the taxation change, then on the contrary, the, the changes or the reluctance to change uh, the, the financial regulation rules. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Uh one more, or shall we go? One more question. There was one. No? Okay, so let's. Yes. Thank you. Thomas, Thomas Gabrajus, Bank of Lithuania. I have a question actually to Torbjorn. Uh, you one of a few remaining countries which still has wealth tax, although the net, net wealth tax. And in your presentation, um, so I assume it wasn't mentioned directly on the slides, but the full deduction of mortgage debt and only partial deduction of debt which is related to equities and other sort of uh, assets. And I was wondering why is that, what is, what is uh, behind the thinking, why uh, sort of the taxation system, the way it is the design, uh, encourages leveraged investments into equities and other financial assets. What's the logic behind? What's the thinking behind? I could understand the political reasons, sort of subsidizing investments into uh, sort of housing, but what's what's behind the uh, equities and other financial assets? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, first question was about dialogue between um, tax authorities and macroprudential authorities. Second was about modeling the impacts. In other words, identifying. Uh, how uh, individual measures affect uh, variables we are interested in through which channels and then something specific on, on Norway. You can pick and choose. <laughs> uh, I can start. I would uh, pick only the first two. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, uh, I have, uh, there is one aspect to add to how the institutional structure of macroprudential policy affects the discussion. We have financial stability committee that consists of heads of central bank, financial supervisory authority, uh, minister of finance and bank guarantee fund. And under the, the committee, there is a per established a permanent working group on directoral level, uh, which discusses and prepares documents for the, for the FSC meeting. And at this meeting, we uh, um, there is an option, a potential to, to discuss uh, how taxes in various areas, not only property taxes, affect functioning of the financial system, including resolution regimes, their effectiveness. Uh, now, the, the twist and the, the, the irony is that uh, even within the uh, Ministry of Finance, the people dealing with financial system are not in this section that deals with taxes. And so this is basically outside the scope. Uh, it's, all everything, uh, it's all under the roof of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, uh, so it's not easy for the Ministry of Finance itself to, to really coordinate uh, the um, uh, financial stability implications of a tax system. And it uh, goes to the second question where I think uh, uh, if you would like to, and perhaps we should confine ourselves in macroprudential policy uh, activity uh, to go for primum non nocere, uh, I would uh, uh, be mostly concerned with uh, uh, interest mortgage uh, deductibility from, uh, from tax revenues uh, as a primary concern for macroprudential policy, uh, whereas, and if there is not a big... Uh, distortion here, I would think that taxes are first, second and in third uh, order about other things than financial stability and therefore macroprudential uh, authorities, even they, if they have analytical power to, to, to answer some of the questions, uh, the, that would not have a big implication of uh, how taxes would be set because financial stability is not really the the, the one of the goals for tax policy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in Denmark, first in terms of coordina coordination mechanism, uh, we do have a systemic uh, risk council where uh, three economic ministries are represented. Not the tax ministry though, but the fix fiscal ministry is one of them, the uh, Ministry for Business, Industry and something, a very long name, is there, and the uh, economic ministry uh, is there. So we do have a mechanism for discussing potential implications of uh, the tax system or changes in the tax system. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's uh, outside the scope of the Systemic Risk Council to have a view on the tax system as such. But of course, uh, uh, what is very important is if you have a political debate in, in terms of where changes to the tax system are on the way, as we did a few years ago in 2016 and 17, when, um, when uh, politicians were trying to land a, an agreement to abolish the tax freeze. Of course, there it's very important also to have an understanding for macroprudential authorities where is this discussion heading. In term, if they actually land an agreement that uh, could perhaps take off some of the underlying issues of uh, potential risk buildup that the macroprudential authority sees. Uh, that's of course helpful to know. Uh, having said that, uh, in Denmark it is not the purpose of macroprudential policy to target house prices, as I think it is not the case in many places. And so, and I just want to state that because it's so, so it's, we're not done with that. And basically, uh, tax, I think it would be a very uh, detailed tax system if you actually wanted to try to uh, somehow tackle the tail risks uh, that we are trying to uh, tackle with macroprudential policy and the excessive risk take on. Uh, so, and so, so therefore, coordination or discussing, understanding where the, the landscape in that you're maneuvering is important. Uh, but also macroprudential policies should not become hostage of potential agreements or, uh, or not in, t uh, in the fiscal area. And, uh, and to give you an example, the Systemic Risk Council in 2017 actually uh, decided to come up with a recommendation to uh, install a sort of a, an LTI lookalike limit, uh, despite the fact that the political negotiations on the tax system were ongoing at the time and they were landed shortly after. Um, um, just one point in terms of understanding uh, how the tax system affects um, borrower behavior and how macroprudential uh, instruments or how the financial regulation instruments affect borrower behavior. Uh, I think in, in 2003, when the, the mortgage uh, bond regulation was deregulated in, in Denmark, the view of the central bank at the time was that this would be a good thing because it would uh, increase the options available to borrowers. So at the time, we actually thought it would be a good thing. Uh, some years down the road, uh, we, were, uh, we were a little bit wiser in terms of how this works. We, uh, the view at the time was that since it did not change user costs, it would probably not matter an awful lot. Uh, having done this natural experiments, uh, we have calculations showing that probably the user cost of households is around 40%, uh, should have a weight of 40% in the decision of households and when they uh, or in that is the 40% determinant of house prices, whereas uh, the first year pay, uh, payment of mortgages actually has a weight of 60% in explaining the development in house prices. Um, that's the results that we got in 2011 study. But I think a lot more work could be done in terms of understanding what actually determines house prices in this regard. 
In terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of of dialogue in uh, in Norway, there we don't have a sort of formal financial stability council. We have sort of three party meetings of uh, of various uh, various sorts with the FSA, the Ministry of Finance, and the Central Bank, but with no. Uh, formal decision uh, making in those meetings, and with respect to uh, different policy proposals, etc., there is there is a long and well established tradition in Norway of public uh, consultations. So say, if you have a tax commission, a government appointed commission uh, with 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 a with a proposal, then and then. Uh, and that's on a, on a public consultation, where typically also uh, authorities like the FSA and Norges mm -hmm. Bank will uh, will state their view in a in a in a letter to uh, uh, to the government. So that's a well established tradition for that. And I completely agree with uh, Francisco in in terms of uh, uh, pointing out the, the the needs for better understanding of uh, all the determinants. Uh, and relationship between between the tax system and, and sort of the key variables that we are interested in, and uh, as I said, there are so many direct and indirect uh, effects that some kind of general equilibrium uh, modeling is is needed. It's also a very sort of ambitious task to to grasp all the all the details uh, here. And then to, to Thomas on the specific question on, on the wealth tax. First of all, I would say that the wealth tax is. Um, at least not necessarily heavily, but at least debated in, in Norway. There are, uh, there are uh, strong forces that want to uh, abolish it, and, they, and, and it also has its strong uh, defendants in terms of distributional effects, uh, etc. So, so the, uh, the most recent uh, tax uh, government uh, commission on sort of reforming a renovated tax system proposed sort of an equal equal valuation across all objects of uh, all all assets. So the whether these are whether they are valued at eighty percent or twenty percent or hundred percent is sort of more more uh, uh, more a matter of scaling as long as the uh, proportional reduction uh, deduction of debt is the same. So why is uh, why is residential real estate uh, treated uh, housing treated differently? Uh, I think one is the uh, sort of the uh, political reluctance to to uh, to tax uh, housing. That why you have, why you have a low uh, uh, low rate of valuation, but still full deduction of of debt. There is also also the um, uh, the argument that it's I think the system of valuing housing in Norway is uh, not completely up to date. To, to be ideally, then you should have a market-based valuation of each house each year. That's not happening, and then you you proxy it with some estimations, etc. And it and it's. Uh, a bit tricky to 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 get that uh, to get that right. That sort of calls count uh, in isolation. That counts for a, a sort of a, a rebate on uh, on that housing level since on on the uh, on the value of housing used in wealth taxation since it's difficult to assess. But mainly, I think this treatment of uh, special treatment of housing is due to sort of. A political wish for preferential uh, treatment of housing. So as many pol pol politicians say, you shouldn't be taxed for your own home. This is my home is my castle. So mm. this is. So. We have three more minutes. Your last chance to ask questions today. Yes, please. Okay, I see my name again, it's Doris Prammer, I'm from the Austrian Central Bank, and I had the impression that the speakers were not too much in favor to use uh, taxation to fine-tune macroeconomic developments. If at all, taxation should be used to stabilize, acting as an automatic stabilizer. And I had the second, my second impression was that you tried to convince us that one should not try to endanger uh, property or real estate rich households which are income poor. But combining these two, th two things, I wonder if then not imputed rent taxation would be the superior solution to property taxation because imputed rent taxation would be on income 
uh, and which is progressive. So it serves two purposes. First of all, it would not burden those uh, poor elderly ladies which don't have a very high income but just low pension income. And on the other hand, it would act as an automatic stabilizer given that it's progressive, which property taxation it's not. And I'm not talking about political economy issues here, I'm just wondering on your views of the economic superiority. Any other questions? Close, so. There was one. Uh, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Not so, not so much a question, but more a remark on the uh, modeling side. Um, we at the IMF uh, are doing some work in that area that uh, was suggested to look at integrated policies um, going forward. So that's something that we will be focusing on. And tomorrow in my talk, I will also discuss the interaction of various policies. So hold on. So, imputed uh, rent taxation. I think you already mentioned the, the difficulty of... Uh, yeah, of we, we, we had it in... in I mean, if, if you can ask economists what would be very efficient and, and they will have one answer. Uh, politicians, they have uh, different uh, objectives uh, and that's, I think that's pretty fair. Um, you can have property taxation that's progressive as well, uh, which we do uh, in, in Denmark, uh, at least in principle. Uh, you can have a different tax rate applied uh, depending on the value of the house. So you can, that can be progressive as well. Um, I don't think, I did not mean to say that uh, Housing taxation should not work as a stabilizing the macroeconomic developments. I do think that they do, even if you leave them alone, just put in tax rates uh, that work uh, throughout the system, then the effective tax will be increasing. When house prices increase, they will be uh, decreasing as house prices decrease. So in that sense, they will do be working as, uh, as, as stabilizers. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, what I have to add. Yeah, I can all... I don't know. Nothing, nothing to add really, that was excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, so it, in order to perhaps to better explain the, um, the view uh, uh, that I wanted to share is that I wanted to concentrate, I want to concentrate on the macro uh, policy and taxes rather than taxes as, uh, okay. as a general theme. And from this perspective of macro use of taxes, I, would, I think it's, uh, uh, you are not in a very good position to, to contemplate it from this perspective. Uh, there are some situations that you might, uh, you have a s strong uh, argument to change something in the taxation that you think uh, ends up in high systemic risk uh, that you can uh, more or less eloquently identify and show to the decision makers on the fiscal side. Uh, but I would not, uh, I don't feel that I have knowledge to venture into how the the right incentive structure on the property market would, uh, would, uh, should, uh, should look like uh, um, in, in, in general. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is that why there is reluctance on political uh, scene to implement these changes. Because for better or for worse, if we would implement something that we believe is more economically efficient, that would definitely still have a profound social consequences uh, uh, with these elderly uh, ladies and uh, gentrification, uh, progressive or regressive taxation. Uh, so I, I don't feel that I can venture confidently in this area uh, as I, I'm not an expert here. If I may just uh, re remind uh, everyone to your multi-layer cake with the cherry on the top and then this inverted pyramid with fiscal policy, which has largest uh, democratic mandate. I think in the face of this argument of democratic mandate, uh, you can forget about uh, imputed rent taxation. 
I mean, who, who is somebody in, 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 in an office, a bureaucrat who will tell me, look, I will increase artificially your income by so much. This is the rent that I think uh, you uh, are getting from owning your home and uh, this will be uh, your uh, enhanced uh, um, uh, base for income taxation. Uh, that will never go through, I think. Uh, that, 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 that kind of uh, argument uh, is impossible to make uh, in, in a democratic uh, society. I, I don't know how countries that have imputed taxation managed to, to, to get it through in the first place. Maybe that's something that, that, that we could find out. Uh, uh, but uh, to introduce it today in this uh, uh, political environment of, of uh, populism, I think uh, that's uh, not, not going to make it. All right. Uh, Thank you very much. I think we've had three very interesting uh, country experiences which were not at all specific, fairly uh, general. And uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, more. So uh, big applause for our panel. So thank you once again for all the speakers. Thank you for a great uh, session moderation. And uh, just, we finish our program for today. But from tomorrow, from 8.30, you are welcome here for a coffee. And we start the program at 9. So I'm really looking forward for tomorrow for the continuation of our great conference. Thank you.